The Album by Anton Chekhov Translation by Constance Garnett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Album by Anton Chekhov Kratorov, the titular counselor, as thin and slender as the admiralty's spire, stepped forward, and addressing Zmayov, said, Your Excellency, moved and touched to the bottom of our hearts by the way you have ruled us during long years, and by your fatherly care, during the course of more than ten years, Zakushin prompted, during the course of more than ten years, we, your subordinates, on this so memorable for us uh, day, beg your excellency to accept, in token of our respect and profound gratitude, this album with your portraits in it, and express our hope that for the duration of your distinguished life, that for long, long years to come, to your dying day, you may not abandon us with your fatherly guidance on the path of justice and progress," added Zakushin, wiping from his brow the perspiration that had suddenly appeared on it. He was evidently longing to speak, and in all probability had a speech already. And, he wound up, may your standard fly for long, long years in the career of genius, industry, and social self-consciousness. A tear trickled down the wrinkled left cheek of Zmayov. Gentlemen, he said in a shaking voice, I did not expect, I had no idea that you were going to celebrate my modest jubilee. I am touched indeed, very much so. I shall not forget this moment to my dying day. And believe me, believe me, friends, that no one is so desirous of your welfare as I am and if there has been anything, it was for your benefit. Zmayov, the actual civil counselor, kissed the titular counselor Kratorov, who had not expected such an honor, and turned pale with the light. Then the chief made a gesture that signified that he could not speak for emotion, and shed tears, as though an expensive album had not been presented to him but, on the contrary, taken from him. Then, when he had a little recovered, and said a few more words full of feeling, and given everyone his hand to shake, he went downstairs amid loud and joyful cheers, got into his carriage, and drove off, followed by their blessings. As he sat in his carriage, he was aware of a flood of joyous feelings such as he had never known before and once more he shed tears. At home new delights awaited him. There his family, his friends and acquaintances had prepared him such an ovation that it seemed to him that he really had been of very great service to his country, and that if he had never existed his country would perhaps have been in a very bad way. The Jubilee dinner was made up of toasts, speeches, and tears. In short, Zmayov had never expected that his merits would be so warmly appreciated. Gentlemen, he said before the dessert, two hours ago I was recompensed for all the sufferings a man has to undergo, who is the servant, so to say, not of routine, not of the letter, but of duty. Through the whole duration of my service, I have constantly adhered to the principle, the public does not exist for us, but we for the public. And today I received the highest reward. My subordinates presented me with an album. See? I was touched. Festive faces bent over the album and began examining it. It's a pretty album, said Zmayov's daughter Olya. It must have cost fifty roubles. I do believe. Oh, it's charming. You must give me the album, Papa. Do you hear? I'll take care of it. It's so pretty. 
After dinner, Olya carried off the album to her room and shut it up in her table drawer. Next day, she took the clerks out of it, flung them on the floor, and put her school friends in their place. The government uniforms made way for white pelerines. Kolya, His Excellency's little son, picked up the clerks and painted their clothes red. Those who had no mustaches he presented with green mustaches and added brown beards to the beardless. When there was nothing left to paint, he cut the little men out of the cardboard, pricked their eyes with a pin, and began playing soldiers with them. After cutting out the titular councillor Kratorov, he fixed him on a matchbox and carried him in that state to his father's study. Papa, a monument! Look! Zmayov burst out laughing, lurched forward, and looking tenderly at the child, gave him a warm kiss on the cheek. <laughs> there, you old rogue! Go and show Mama. Let Mama look, too. End of The Album by Anton Chekhov Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake This recording is in the public domain. A Fable by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carol White. A Fable by Mark Twain. Once upon a time, an artist who had painted a small and very beautiful picture placed it so that he could see it in the mirror. He said, this doubles the distance and softens it, and it is twice as lovely as it was before. The animals out in the woods heard of this through the house cat, who was greatly admired by them because he was so learned and so refined and civilized and so polite and high-bred, and could tell them so much which they didn't know before, and were not certain about afterward. They were much excited about this new piece of gossip, and they asked questions so as to get at a full understanding of it. They asked what a picture was, and the cat explained. It is a flat thing, he said, wonderfully flat, marvelously flat, enchantingly flat and elegant, and oh, so beautiful. That excited them almost to a frenzy, and they said they would give the world to see it. Then the bear asked, What is it that makes it so beautiful? It is the looks of it, said the cat. This filled them with admiration and uncertainty, and they were more excited than ever. Then the cow asked, what is a mirror? It is a hole in the wall, said the cat. You look in it, and there you see the picture. And it is so dainty and charming and ethereal and inspiring in its unimaginable beauty that your head turns round and round and you almost swoon with ecstasy. The ass had not said anything yet. He now began to throw doubts. He said there had never been anything as beautiful as this before, and probably wasn't now. He said that when it took a whole basket full of sesquipedalian adjectives to whoop up a thing of beauty, it was time for suspicion. It was easy to see that these doubts were having an effect upon the animals, so the cat went off, offended. The subject was dropped for a couple of days, but in the meantime curiosity was taking a fresh start, and there was a revival of interest perceptible. Then the animals assailed the ass for spoiling what could possibly have been a pleasure to them on a mere suspicion that the picture was not beautiful, without any evidence that such was the case. The ass was not troubled. He was calm, and said there was one way to find out who was in the right, himself or the cat. He would go and look in that hole and come back and tell what he found there. The animals felt relieved and grateful, and asked him to go at once, which he did. But he did not know where he ought to stand, and so through error he stood between the picture and the mirror. The result was that the picture had no chance and didn't show up. He returned home and said, The cat lied. There was nothing in that hole but an ass. There wasn't a sign of a flat thing visible. It was a handsome ass and friendly, but just an ass and nothing more. The elephant asked, Did you see it good and clear? Were you close to it? I saw it good and clear, O oh, Hathi, king of beasts. I was so close that I touched noses with it. This is very strange, said the elephant. The cat was always truthful before, as far as we could make out. 
Let another witness try. Go, Baloo, look in the hole, and come and report. So the bear went. When he came back, he said, Both the cat and the ass have lied. There was nothing in the hole but a bear. Great was the surprise and puzzlement of the animals. Each was now anxious to make the test himself and get at the straight truth. The elephant sent them one at a time. First, the cow. She found nothing in the hole but a cow. The tiger found nothing in it but a tiger. The lion found nothing in it but a lion. The leopard found nothing in it but a leopard. The camel found a camel and nothing more. The hothi was wroth and said he would have the truth if he had to go and fetch it himself. When he returned, he abused his whole subjectry for liars and was in an unappeasable fury with the moral and mental blindness of the cat. He said anybody but a nearsighted fool could see that there was nothing in the hole but an elephant. Moral by the cat. You can find in a text whatever you bring if you will stand between it and the mirror of your imagination. You may not see your ears, but they will be there. End of A Fable by Mark Twain By Saki. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Christopher Hart on March 19th, 2008, in Ottawa, Ontario. There is a wild beast in your woods, said the artist Cunningham, as he was being driven to the station. It was the only remark he had made during the drive, but as Van Cheel had talked incessantly, his companion's silence had not been noticeable. A stray fox or two and some resident weasels, nothing more formidable, said Van Cheel. The artist said nothing. What did you mean about a wild beast, said Van Scheele later, when they were on the platform. Nothing. My imagination. Here is the train, said Cunningham. That afternoon Van Scheele went for one of his frequent rambles through his woodland property. He had stuffed a bittern in his study and knew the names of quite a number of wild flowers, so his aunt had possibly some justification in describing him as a great naturalist. At any rate, he was a great walker. It was his custom to take mental notes of everything he saw during his walks, not so much for the purpose of assisting contemporary science as to provide topics for conversation afterwards. When the bluebells began to show themselves in flower, he made a point of informing everyone of the fact. The season of the year might have warmed his hearers of the likelihood of such an occurrence, but at least they felt that he was being absolutely frank with them. What Van Scheele saw in this particular afternoon was, however, something far removed from his ordinary range of experience. On a shelf of smooth stone overhanging a deep pool in the hollow of an oak coppice, a boy of about sixteen lay asprawl, drying his wet brown limbs luxuriously in the sun. His wet hair, parted by a recent dive, lay close to his head, and his light brown eyes, so light that there was an almost tigerish gleam in them, were turned towards Van Cheel with a certain lazy watchfulness. It was an unexpected apparition, and Van Cheel found himself engaged in the novel process of thinking before he spoke. Where on earth could this wild-looking boy hail from? The miller's wife had lost a child some two months ago, supposed to have been swept away by the mill race, but that had been a mere baby, not a half-grown lad. What are you doing there? he demanded. Obviously, sunning myself, replied the boy. Where do you live? Here, in these woods. You can't live in the woods, said Van Cheel. They are very nice woods, said the boy, with a touch of patronage in his voice. But where do you sleep at night? I don't sleep at night. That's my busiest time. Van Cheel began to have an irritated feeling that he was grappling with a problem that was eluding him. What do you feed on? he asked. Flesh, said the boy, and he pronounced the word with slow relish, as though he were tasting it. Flesh? What flesh? Since it interests you, rabbits, wild fowl, hares, poultry, lambs in their season, children when I can get any. They're usually too well locked in at night when I do most of my hunting. It's quite two months since I tasted child flesh. 
Ignoring the chafing nature of the last remark, Van Cheel tried to draw the boy on the subject of possible poaching operations. You're talking rather through your hat when you speak of feeding on hares. Considering the nature of the boy's toilet, the simile was hardly an apt one. Our hillside hares aren't easily caught. At night I hunt on four feet, was the somewhat cryptic response. I suppose you mean that you hunt with a dog, hazarded Van Cheel. The boy rolled slowly over onto his back and laughed a weird low laugh that was pleasantly like a chuckle and disagreeably like a snarl. I don't fancy any dog would be very anxious for my company, especially at night. Van Cheel began to feel that there was something positively uncanny about the strange-eyed, strange-tongued youngster. I can't have you staying in these woods, he declared authoritatively. I fancy you'd rather have me here than in your house, said the boy. The prospect of this wild, nude animal in Van Cheek's primly ordered house was certainly an alarming one. If you don't go, I shall have to make you, said Van Cheel. The boy turned like a flash, plunged into the pool, and in a moment had flung his wet and glistening body halfway up the bank where Van Cheel was standing. In an otter, the movement would not have been remarkable. In a boy, Van Cheel found it sufficiently startling. His foot slipped as he made an involuntary backward movement, and he found himself almost prostrate on the slippery, weed-grown bank, with those tigerish yellow eyes not very far from his own. Almost instinctively, he half raised his hand to his throat. The boy laughed again. A laugh in which the snarl had nearly driven out the chuckle, and then, with another of his astonishing lightning movements, plunged out of view into a yielding tangle of weed and fern. What an extraordinary wild animal, said Van Cheel as he picked himself up. And then he recalled Cunningham's remark, There is a wild beast in your woods. Walking slowly homeward, Van Cheel began to turn over in his mind various local occurrences which might be traceable to the existence of this astonishing young savage. Something had been thinning the game in the woods lately. Poultry had been missing from the farms. Hares were growing unaccountably scarcer, and complaints had reached him of lambs being carried off bodily from the hills. Was it possible that this wild boy was really hunting the countryside in company with some clever poacher dog? He had spoken of hunting four-footed by night, but then again he had hinted strangely at no dog caring to come near him, especially at night. It was certainly puzzling. And then, as Van Cheel ran his mind over the various depredations that had been committed during the last month or two, he came suddenly to a dead stop, alike in his walk and his speculations. The child missing from the mill two months ago. The accepted theory was that it had tumbled into the mill race and had been swept away. But the mother had always declared she had heard a shriek on the hillside of the house in the opposite direction from the water. It was unthinkable, of course. But he wished that the boy had not made that uncanny remark about child flesh eaten two months ago. Such dreadful things should not be said even in fun. Van Cheel, contrary to his usual wont, did not feel disposed to be communicative about his discovery in the wood. His position as a parish councillor and justice of the peace seemed somehow compromised by the fact that he was harboring a personality of such doubtful repute on his property. There was even a possibility that a heavy bill of damages for raided lambs and poultry might be laid at his door. At dinner that night he was quite unusually silent. "'Where's your voice gone to?' said his aunt. "'One would think you had seen a wolf.' Van Scheel, who was not familiar with the old saying, thought the remark rather foolish. If he had seen a wolf on his property, his tongue would have been extraordinarily busy with the subject. At breakfast next morning, Van Cheel was conscious that his feeling of uneasiness regarding yesterday's episode had not wholly disappeared, and he resolved to go by train to the neighboring cathedral town, hunt up Cunningham, and learn from him what he had really seen that had prompted the remark about a wild beast in the woods. With this resolution taken, his usual cheerfulness partially returned, and he hummed a bright little melody as he sauntered to the morning room for his customary cigarette. 
As she entered the room, the melody made way abruptly for a pious invocation. Grace Phileas sprawl on the ottoman, in an attitude of almost exaggerated repose, was the boy of the woods. He was drier than when Van Cheel had last seen him, but no other alteration was noticeable in his toilet. "'How dare you come here?' asked Van Cheel furiously. "'You told me I was not to stay in the woods,' said the boy calmly. "'But not to come here, supposing my aunts should see you.' And with a view to minimizing that catastrophe, Van Cheel hastily obscured as much of his unwelcome guest as possible under the fold of a morning post. At that moment his aunt entered the room. This is a poor boy who has lost his way and lost his memory. He doesn't know who he is or where he comes from, explained Van Cheel desperately, glancing apprehensively at the waif's face to see whether he was going to add inconvenient candor to his other savage propensities. Miss Van Cheel was enormously interested. Perhaps his underlinen is marked, she suggested. He seems to have lost most of that, too, said Van Cheel, making frantic little grabs at the morning post to keep it in its place. A naked homeless child appealed to Miss Van Cheel as warmly as a stray kitten or a derelict puppy would have done. We must do all we can for him, she decided, and in very short time messenger, dispatched to the rectory, where a page boy was kept had her turn with a suit of pantry clothes and the necessary accessories of shirts, shoes, collar, etc. Clothed, clean, and groomed, the boy lost none of his uncanniness in Van Cheel's eyes, but his aunt found him sweet. We must call him something till we know who he really is, she said. Gabriel Ernest, I think. Those are nice, suitable names. Van Cheel agreed. But he privately doubted whether they were being grafted on to a nice, suitable child. His misgivings were not diminished by the fact that his staid and elderly spaniel had bolted out of the house at the first incoming of the boy, and now obstinately remained shivering and yapping at the farther end of the orchard, while the canary, usually as vocally industrious as Van Cheel himself, had put himself on an allowance of frightened cheeps. More than ever, he was resolved to consult Cunningham without loss of time. As he drove off to the station, his aunt was arranging that Gabriel Ernest should help her to entertain the infant members of her Sunday school class at tea that afternoon. Cunningham was not at first disposed to be communicative. My mother died of some brain trouble, he explained, so you will understand why I'm averse to dwelling on anything of an impossibly fantastic nature that I may see or think that I have seen. But what did you see? persisted Van Cheel. What I thought I saw was something so extraordinary that no really sane man could dignify it with the credit of having actually happened. I was standing, the last evening I was with you, half hidden in the hedge growth by the orchard gate, watching the dying glow of the sunset. Suddenly I became aware of a naked boy, a bather from some neighboring pool I took him to be who was standing out on the bare hillside also watching the sunset. His pose was so suggestive of some wild fawn of pagan myth that I instantly wanted to engage him as a model, and in another moment I think I should have hailed him. But just then the sun dipped out of view, and all the orange and pink slid out of the landscape, leaving it cold and grey. And at the same moment an astounding thing happened. The boy vanished too. What? "'Vanished away into nothing?' asked Van Cheel excitedly. "'No. That is the dreadful part of it,' answered the artist. "'On the open hillside where the boy had been standing a second ago "'stood a large wolf, blackish in color, with gleaming fangs and cruel yellow eyes, you may think. "'But Van Cheel did not stop for anything as futile as thought. "'Already he was tearing at top speed towards the station. "'He dismissed the idea of a telegram.' Gabriel Ernest as a werewolf was a hopelessly inadequate effort at conveying the situation, and his aunt would think it was a code message to which he had omitted to give her the key. His one hope was that he might reach home before sundown. The cab which he charged at the other end of the railway journey bore him with what seemed exasperating slowness along the country roads, which were pink and mauve with the flush of the sinking sun. His aunt was putting away some unfinished jams and cake when he arrived. "'Where is Gabriel Ernest?' he almost screamed. "'He is taking the little toop child home,' said his aunt. 
It was getting so late, I thought it wasn't safe to let it go back alone. What a lovely sunset, isn't it? But Van Cheel, although not oblivious of the glow in the western sky, did not stay to discuss its beauties. At a speed for which he was scarcely geared, he raced along the narrow lane that led to the home of the Toops. On one side ran the swift current of the mill stream, on the other rose the stretch of bare hillside. A dwindling rim of red sun showed still on the skyline, and the next turning must bring him in view of the ill-assorted couple he was pursuing. Then the color went suddenly out of things, and a gray light settled itself with a quick shiver over the landscape. Van Cheel heard a shrill wail of fear and stopped running. Nothing was ever seen again of the Toop child or Gabriel Ernest, but the latter's discarded garments were found lying in the road. So it was assumed that the child had fallen into the water and the boy had stripped and jumped in in a vain endeavor to save it. Van Cheel and some workmen who were nearby at the time testified to having heard a child scream loudly just near the spot where the clothes were found. Mrs. Toop, who had eleven other children, was decently resigned to her bereavement, but Miss Van Cheel sincerely mourned her lost foundling. It was on her initiative that a memorial brass was put up in the parish church to Gabriel Ernest, an unknown boy, who bravely sacrificed his life for another. Van Cheel gave way to his aunt in most things, but he flatly refused to subscribe to the Gabriel Ernest Memorial. End of Gabriel Ernest by Sackey. A Ghost by Guy de Maupassant Translated by M. Charles Summer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Neil Donnelly A Ghost by Guy de Maupassant We were speaking of sequestration, alluding to a recent lawsuit. It was at the close of a friendly evening in a very old mansion in the Rue de Grenelle, and each of the guests had a story to tell, which he assured us was true. Then the old Marquis de la Tour Samuel, eighty-two years of age, rose and came forward to lean on the mantelpiece. He told the following story in his slightly quavering voice. I also have witnessed a strange thing, so strange that it has been the nightmare of my life. It happened fifty-six years ago, and yet there is not a month when I do not see it again in my dreams. From that day I have borne a mark, a stamp of fear. Do you understand? Yes, for ten minutes I was a prey to terror in such a way that ever since a constant dread has remained in my soul. Unexpected sounds chill me to the heart. Objects which I can ill distinguish in the evening shadows make me long to flee. I am afraid at night. No, I would not have owned such a thing before reaching my present age. But now I may tell everything. One may fear imaginary dangers at eighty-two years old, but before actual danger I have never turned back, madames. That affair so upset my mind, filled me with such a deep, mysterious unrest, that I never could tell it. I kept it in that inmost part, that corner where we conceal our sad, our shameful secrets, all the weaknesses of our life which cannot be confessed. I will tell you that strange happening just as it took place, with no attempt to explain it. Unless I went mad for one short hour, it must be explainable, though. Yet I was not mad, and I will prove it to you. Imagine what you will. Here are the simple facts. It was in 1827, in July. I was quartered with my regiment in Rouen. One day, as I was strolling on the quay, I came across a man I believed I recognized. Though I could not place him with certainty, I instinctively went more slowly, ready to pause. The stranger saw my impulse, looked at me, and fell into my arms. It was a friend of my younger days, of whom I had been very fond. He seemed to have become half a century older in the five years since I had seen him. His hair was white, and he stooped in his walk as if he were exhausted. He understood my amazement and told me the story of his life. 
a terrible event had broken him down. He had fallen madly in love with a young girl and married her in a kind of dreamlike ecstasy. After a year of unalloyed bliss and unexhausted passion, she had died suddenly of heart disease, no doubt killed by love itself. He had left the country on the very day of her funeral and had come to live in his hotel at Rouen. He remained there, solitary and desperate, grief slowly mining him, so wretched that he constantly thought of suicide. As I thus came across you again, he said, I shall ask a great favor of you. I want you to go to my chateau and get some papers I urgently need. They are in the writing desk of my room, of our room. I cannot send a servant or a lawyer, as the errand must be kept private. I want absolute silence. I shall give you the key of the room which I locked carefully myself before leaving, and the key to the writing desk. I shall also give you a note for the gardener, who will let you in. Come to breakfast with me tomorrow, and we'll talk the matter over." I promised to render him that slight service. It would mean but a pleasant excursion for me, his home not being more than twenty-five miles from Rouen. I could go there in an hour on horseback. At ten o'clock the next day I was with him. We breakfasted alone together, yet he did not utter more than twenty words. He asked me to excuse him. The thought that I was going to visit the room where his happiness lay shattered upset him, he said. Indeed, he seemed perturbed, worried, as if some mysterious struggle were taking place in his soul. At last he explained exactly what I was to do. It was very simple. I was to take two packages of letters and some papers, locked in the first drawer at the right of the desk of which I had the key. He added, I need not ask you not to glance at them. I was almost hurt by his words, and told him so rather sharply. He stammered, Forgive me, I suffer so much, and tears came to his eyes. I left about one o'clock to accomplish my errand. The day was radiant, and I rushed through the meadows, listening to the song of the larks, and the rhythmical beat of my sword and my riding boots. Then I entered the forest, and I set my horse to walking. Branches of the trees softly caressed my face and now and then I would catch a leaf between my teeth and bite it with avidity, full of the joy of life, such as fills you without reason, with a tumultuous happiness almost indefinable, a kind of magical strength. As I neared the house I took out the letter for the gardener and noted with surprise that it was sealed. I was so amazed and so annoyed that I almost turned back without fulfilling my mission. Then I thought that I should thus display oversensitiveness and bad taste. My friend might have sealed it unconsciously, worried as he was. The manor looked as though it had been deserted the last twenty years. The gate, wide open and rotten, held one wondered how. Grass filled the paths. You could not tell the flower beds from the lawn. At the noise I made, kicking a shutter, an old man came out from a side door, and was apparently amazed to see me there. I dismounted from my horse and gave him the letter. He read it once or twice, turned it over, looked at me with suspicion, and asked, "'Well, what do you want?' I answered sharply, "'You must know it, as you have read your master's orders. I want to get in the house.' He appeared overwhelmed. He said, "'So you are going in, in his room?' I was getting impatient. "'Parbleu! Do you intend to question me by chance?' He stammered. No, monsieur, only it has not been opened since since the death. If you will wait five minutes, I will go in to see whether— I interrupted angrily. See here, are you joking? You can't go in that room, as I have the key. He no longer knew what to say. Then, monsieur, I will show you the way. Show me the stairs and leave me alone. I can find it without your help. But still, monsieur— then I lost my temper. Now be quiet, else you'll be sorry. I roughly pushed him aside and went into the house. I first went through the kitchen, then crossed two small rooms occupied by the man and his wife. From there I stepped into a large hall. I went up the stairs and recognized the door my friend had described to me. I opened it with ease and went in. The room was so dark that at first I could not distinguish anything. I paused, arrested by the moldy and stale odor peculiar to deserted and condemned rooms—of dead rooms. 
Then gradually my eyes grew accustomed to the gloom, and I saw rather clearly a great room in disorder, a bed without sheets having still its mattresses and pillows, one of which bore the deep print of an elbow or a head, as if someone had just been resting on it. The chairs seemed all in confusion. I noticed that a door, probably that of a closet, had remained ajar. I first went to the window and opened it to get some light, but the hinges of the outside shutters were so rusted that I could not loosen them. I even tried to break them with my sword, but did not succeed. As those fruitless attempts irritated me, and as my eyes were by now adjusted to the dim light, I gave up hope of getting more light and went toward the writing desk. I sat down in an armchair, folded back the top, and opened the drawer. It was full to the edge. I needed but three packages which I knew how to distinguish, and I started looking for them. I was straining my eyes to decipher the inscriptions when I thought I heard, or rather felt, a rustle behind me. I took no notice, thinking a draft had lifted some curtain, but a minute later another movement, almost indistinct, sent a disagreeable little shiver over my skin. It was so ridiculous to be moved thus, even so slightly, that I would not turn round, being ashamed. I had just discovered the second package I needed, and was on the point of reaching for the third, when a great and sorrowful sigh, close to my shoulder, made me give a mad leap two yards away. In my spring I had turned round, my hand on the hilt of my sword, and surely had I not felt that I should have fled like a coward. A tall woman, dressed in white, was facing me, standing behind the chair in which I had sat a second before. Such a shudder ran through me that I almost fell back. Oh, no one who has not felt them can understand those gruesome and ridiculous terrors. The soul melts, your heart seems to stop, your whole body becomes limp as a sponge, and your innermost parts seem collapsing. I do not believe in ghosts. And yet I broke down before the hideous fear of the dead, and I suffered, oh, I suffered more in a few minutes in the irresistible anguish of supernatural dread than I have suffered in all the rest of my life. If she had not spoken, I might have died. But she did speak. She spoke in a soft and plaintive voice which set my nerves vibrating. I could not say that I regained my self-control. No, I was past knowing what I did, but the kind of pride I have in me is, well, as a military pride, helped me to maintain, almost in spite of myself, an honorable countenance. I, I was making a pose, a pose for myself and for her, for her, whatever she was, woman or phantom. I realized this later, for at the time of the apparition I could think of nothing. I was afraid. She said, Oh, you can be of great help to me, monsieur. I tried to answer, but I was unable to utter one word. A vague sound came from my throat. She continued, Will you? You can save me, cure me. I suffer terribly. I always suffer. I suffer. Oh, I suffer. And she sat down gently in my chair. She looked at me. Will you? I nodded my head, being still paralyzed. Then she handed me a woman's comb of tortoise shell and murmured, Comb my hair, oh, comb my hair. That will cure me. Look at my head, how I suffer, and my hair, how it hurts. Her loose hair, very long, very black, it seemed to me, hung over the back of the chair, touching the floor. Why did I do it? Why did I, shivering, accept that comb, and why did I take between my hands her long hair which left on my skin a ghastly impression of cold, as if I had handled serpents? I do not know. That feeling still clings about my fingers, and I shiver when I recall it. I combed her, I handled, I know not how, that hair of ice. I bound and unbound it, I plaited it as one plates a horse's mane. She sighed, bent her head, seemed happy. Suddenly she said, Thank you, tore the comb from my hands, and fled through the door which I had noticed was half opened. Left alone, I had for a few seconds the hazy feeling one feels in waking up from a nightmare. 
Then I recovered myself. I ran to the window and broke the shutters by my furious assault. A stream of light poured in. I rushed to the door through which that being had gone. I found it locked and immovable. Then a fever of flight seized on me, a panic, the true panic of battle. I quickly grasped the three packages of letters from the open desk. I crossed the room running. I took the steps of the stairway four at a time. I found myself outside, I don't know how, and seeing my horse close by, I mounted in one leap and left at a full gallop. I didn't stop till I reached Rouen and drew up in front of my house. Having thrown the reins to my orderly, I flew to my room and locked myself in to think. Then for an hour I asked myself whether I had not been the victim of an hallucination. Certainly I must have had one of those nervous shocks, one of those brain disorders such as give rise to miracles, to which the supernatural owes its strength. And I had almost concluded that it was a vision, an illusion of my senses, when I came near to the window. My eyes by chance looked down. My tunic was covered with hairs, long woman's hairs, which had entangled themselves around the buttons. I took them off one by one and threw them out of the window with trembling fingers. I then called my orderly. I felt too perturbed, too moved to go and see my friend on that day. Besides, I needed to think over what I should tell him. I had his letters delivered to him. He gave a receipt to the soldier. He inquired after me and was told that I was not well. I had had a sunstroke or something. He seemed distressed. I went to see him the next day, early in the morning, bent on telling him the truth. He had gone out the evening before and had not come back. I returned the same day, but he had not been seen. I waited a week. He did not come back. I notified the police. They searched for him everywhere, but no one could find any trace of his passing or of his retreat. A careful search was made in the deserted manor. No suspicious clue was discovered. There was no sign that a woman had been concealed there. The inquest gave no result, and so the search went no further. And in fifty-six years I have learned nothing more. I never found out the truth. End of A Ghost Kitty's Class Day by Louisa May Alcott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn Francis. Kitty's Class Day by Louisa May Alcott. A Stitch in Time Saves Nine. Oh, Pris, Pris, I'm really going. Here's the invitation. Rough paper, chapel spreads, lyceum hall, everything splendid, and Jack to take care of me. As Kitty burst into the room and performed a rapturous passal, waving the cards over her head, Sister Priscilla looked up from her work with a smile of satisfaction on her quiet face. Who invites you, dear? Why, Jack, of course. Dear old cousin Jack, nobody else ever thinks of me or cares whether I have a bit of pleasure now and then. Isn't he kind? Mayn't I go? And, oh, Pris, what shall I wear? Kitty paused suddenly as if the last all-important question had a solemnizing effect upon both mind and body. Why, your white muslin, silk sack and new hat, of course began Pris with an air of surprise, but Kitty broke in impetuously. I'll never wear that old muslin again. It's full of darns, up to my knees, and all out of fashion. So is my sack, and as for my hat, though it does well enough here, it would be absurd for class day. You don't expect an entirely new suit for this occasion, do you? asked Pris anxiously. Yes, I do, and I'll tell you how I mean to get it. I've planned everything, for though I hardly dreamed of going, I amused myself by thinking how I could manage if I did get invited. Let us hear. 
and Pris took up her work with an air of resignation. First, my dress, began Kitty, perching herself on the arm of the sofa and entering into the subject with enthusiasm. I've got the ten dollars Grandpa sent me, and with eight of it, I'm going to buy Lizzie King's organdy muslin. She got it in Paris, but her aunt providently, no, unfortunately, died, so she can't wear it and wants to get rid of it. She is bigger than I am, you know, so there is enough for a little mantle or sack, for it isn't made up. The skirt is cut off and gored, with a splendid train. My dear, you don't mean you're going to wear one of those absurd new-fashioned dresses," exclaimed Pris, lifting hands and eyes. I do. Nothing would induce me to go to class day without a train. It's been the desire of my heart to have one, and now I will, if I never have another gown to my back," returned Kitty with immense decision. Pris shook her head and said, Go on, as if prepared for any extravagance after that. We can make it ourselves, continued Kitty, and trim it with the same. It's white with blue stripes and daisies in the stripes. The loveliest thing you ever saw, and can't be got here. So simple, yet distingue. I know you'll like it. Next my bonnet. Here the solemnity of Kitty's face and manner was charming to behold. I shall make it out of one of my new illusion undersleeves. I've never worn them, and the puffed part will be a plenty for a little flyaway bonnet of the latest style. I've got blue ribbons to tie it with, and have only to look up some daisies for the inside. With my extra two dollars I shall buy my gloves and pay my fares. And there I am, all complete." She looked so happy, so pretty, and full of girlish satisfaction, that Sister Pris couldn't bear to disturb the little plan, much as she disapproved of it. They were poor, and every penny had to be counted. There were plenty of neighbors to gossip and criticize, and plenty of friends to make disagreeable remarks on any unusual extravagance. Pris saw things with the prudent eyes of thirty, but Kitty with the romantic eyes of seventeen, and the elder sister, in the kindness of her heart, had no wish to sadden life to those bright young eyes or deny the child a harmless pleasure. She sewed thoughtfully for a minute, then looked up, saying, with a smile that always assured Kitty the day was won, "'Get your things together, and we will see what can be done. But remember, dear, that it is both bad taste and bad economy for poor people to try to ape the rich. You're a perfect angel, Pris, so don't moralize. I'll run and get the dress, and we'll begin at once, for there is much to do and only two days to do it in." And Kitty skipped away singing Laranger Horatus at the top of her voice. Priscilla soon found that the girl's head was completely turned by the advice and example of certain fashionable young neighbors. It was in vain for Pris to remonstrate and warn. Just this once let me do as others do, and thoroughly enjoy myself," pleaded Kitty. And Pris yielded, saying to herself, She shall have her wish, and if she learns a lesson, neither time nor money will be lost. So they snipped and sewed and planned and pieced, going through all the alternations of despair and triumph, worry and satisfaction which women undergo when a new suit is under way. Company kept coming, for news of Kitty's expedition had flown abroad, and her young friends must just run in to hear about it and ask what she was going to wear, while Kitty was so glad and proud to tell and show and enjoy her little triumph that many half-hours were wasted, and the second day found much still to do. The lovely muslin didn't hold out, and Kitty sacrificed the waist to the train, for a train she must have, or the whole thing would be an utter failure. A little sack was eked out, however, 
and when the frills were on it was ravishing, as Kitty said, with a sigh of mingled delight and fatigue. The gored skirt was a fearful job, as any one who has ever plunged into the mysteries will testify, and before the facing even experienced Pris quailed. The bonnet also was a trial, for when the lace was on it was discovered that the ribbons didn't match the dress. Here was a catastrophe. Kitty frantically rummaged the house, the shops, the stores of her friends, and rummaged in vain. There was no time to send to the city, and despair was about to fall on Kitty when Pris rescued her by quietly making one of the small sacrifices, which were easy to her because her life was spent for others. Someone suggested a strip of blue illusion, and that could be got. But alas, Kitty had no money, for the gloves were already bought. Pris heard the lamentations, and giving up fresh ribbons for herself, pulled her sister out of a slow of despond with two yards of heavenly tulle. Now the daisies, and oh, dear me, not one can I find in this poverty-stricken town sighed Kitty, prinking at the glass and fervently hoping that nothing would happen to her complexion overnight. "'I see plenty just like those on your dress,' answered Pris, nodding toward the meadow full of young white weed. "'Pris, you're a treasure! I'll wear real ones. They keep well, I know, and are so common I can refresh my bonnet anywhere. It's a splendid idea!' Away rushed Kitty to return with an apron full of American daisies. A pretty cluster was soon fastened just over the left-hand frizzle of bright hair, and the little bonnet was complete. "'Now, Pris, tell me how I look,' cried Kitty, as she swept into the room late that afternoon in full gala costume. It would have been impossible for the primest, the sourest, or the most sensible creature in the world to say that it wasn't a pretty sight. The long train, the big chignon, the apology for a bonnet, were all ridiculous. No one could deny that. But youth, beauty, and a happy heart made even those absurdities charming. The erect young figure gave an air to the crisp folds of the delicate dress. The bright eyes and fresh cheeks under the lace rosette made one forget its size, and the rippling brown hair won admiration in spite of the ugly bunch which disfigured the girl's head. The little jacket set divinely, the new gloves were as immaculate as white kids could be, and to crown all, Lizzie King, in a burst of generosity, lent Kitty the blue and white Paris sunshade which she couldn't use herself. Now I could die content. I'm perfect in all respects, and I know Jack won't be ashamed of me. I really owe it to him to look my best, you know, and that's why I'm so particular," said Kitty in an apologetic tone, as she began to lay away her finery. I hope you will enjoy every minute of the time, dearie. Don't forget to finish running up the facing. I've basted it carefully and would do it if my head didn't ache so. I really can't hold it up any longer," answered Pris, who had worked like a disinterested bee while Kitty had flown about like a distracted butterfly. "'Go and lie down, you dear kind soul, and don't think of my nonsense again,' said Kitty, feeling remorseful, till Pris was completely asleep, when she went to her room and reveled in her finery till bedtime. So absorbed was she in learning to manage her train gracefully that she forgot the facing till very late. Then, being worn out with work and worry, she did what girls are too apt to do, stuck a pin here and there, and, trusting to Priscilla's careful bastings, left it as it was, retiring to dream of a certain Horace Fletcher, whose aristocratic elegance had made a deep impression upon her during the few evenings she had seen him. Nothing could have been lovelier than the morning, and few hearts happier than Kitty's, 
as she arrayed herself with the utmost care and waited in solemn state for the carriage, for muslin trains and dewy roads were incompatible, and one luxury brought another. "'My goodness! Where did she get that stylish suit?' whispered Miss Smith to Miss Jones, as Kitty floated into the station with all sail set, finding it impossible to resist the temptation to astonish certain young ladies who had snubbed her in times past, which snubs had rankled, and were now avenged. "'I looked everywhere for a muslin for today and couldn't find any I liked, so I was forced to wear my mauve silk,' observed Miss Smith, complacently settling the silvery folds of her dress. "'It's very pretty, but one ruins a silk at class day, you know. I thought this organdy would be more comfortable and appropriate this warm day. A friend brought it from Paris, and it's like one the Princess of Wales wore at the great flower show this year.' returned Kitty, with the air of a young lady who had all her dresses from Paris, and was intimately acquainted with the royal family. Those girls were entirely extinguished by this stroke, and hadn't a word to say for themselves, while Kitty casually mentioned Horace Fletcher, Lyceum Hall, and Cousin Jack, for they had only a little freshman brother to boast of, and were not going to Lyceum Hall. As she stepped out of the cars at Cambridge, Jack opened his honest blue eyes and indulged in a low whistle of astonishment. For if there was anything he especially hated, it was the trains, chignons, and tiny bonnets then in fashion. He was very fond of Kitty, and prided himself on being able to show his friends a girl who was charming and yet not overdressed. She has made a regular guy of herself. I won't tell her so, and the dear little soul shall have a jolly time in spite of her fuss and feathers. But I do wish she had let her hair alone and worn that pretty hat of hers." As this thought passed through Jack's mind, he smiled and bowed, and made his way among the crowd, whispering as he drew his cousin's arm through his own. "'Why, Kitty, you are got up regardless of expense, aren't you? I'm so glad you came. We'll have a rousing good time, and you shall see all the fun." "'Oh, thank you, Jack. Do I look nice, really? I tried to be a credit to you and Pris, and I did have such a job of it. I'll make you laugh over it some time. A carriage for me? Bless us how fine we are!' And Kitty stepped in, feeling that only one thing more was needed to make her cup overflow. That one thing was speedily vouchsafed, for before her skirts were smoothly settled, Jack called out in his hearty way, "'How are you, Fletcher? If you are bound for chapel, I'll take you up.' "'Thanks. Good morning, Miss Heath.' It was all done in an instant, and the next thing Kitty knew, she was rolling away with the elegant Horace sitting opposite. How little it takes to make a young girl happy! a pretty dress, sunshine, and somebody opposite, and they are blessed. Kitty's face glowed and dimpled with pleasure as she glanced about her, especially when she, sitting in state with two gentlemen all to herself, passed those girls walking in the dust with a beardless boy. She felt that she could forgive past slights, and did so with a magnanimous smile and bow. Both Jack and Fletcher had graduated the year before, but still took an interest in their old haunts and patronized the fellows who were not yet through the mill, at least the seniors and juniors. Of softs and freshs, they were sublimely unconscious. Greeted by frequent slaps on the shoulder, and hearty, how are you, old fellows, they piloted Kitty to a seat in the chapel. An excellent place but the girl's satisfaction was marred by Fletcher's desertion, and she could not see anything attractive about the dashing young lady in the pink bonnet to whom he devoted himself, because she was a stranger, Kitty said. Everybody knows what goes on in the chapel. After the fight and scramble are over, the rustle and buzz, the music, the oratory and the poem, during which the men cheer and the girls simper, 
The professors yawn, and the poet's friends pronounce him a second Longfellow. Then the closing flourishes, the grand crush, and general scattering. Then the fun really begins as far as the young folks are concerned. They don't mind swarming up and down stairs in a solid phalanx. They can enjoy half a dozen courses of salad, ice and strawberries, with stout gentlemen crushing their feet, anxious mammas sticking sharp elbows into their sides, and absent-minded tutors walking over them. They can flirt vigorously in a torrid atmosphere of dinner, dust, and din, can smile with hot coffee running down their backs, small avalanches of ice cream descending upon their best bonnets and sandwiches, butter side down, reposing on their delicate silks. They know that it is a costly rapture, but they carefully refrain from thinking of the morrow, and energetically illustrate the Yankee maxim which bids us enjoy ourselves in our early bloom. Kitty did have a rousing good time, for Jack was devoted, taking her everywhere, showing her everything, feeding and fanning her and festooning her train with untiring patience. How many forcible expressions he mentally indulged in as he walked on that unlucky train we will not record. He smiled and skipped and talked of treading on flowers in a way that would have charmed Kitty if someone else had not been hovering about the daisy, as Fletcher called her. After he returned, she neglected Jack, who took it coolly, and was never in the way unless she wanted him. For the first time in her life, Kitty deliberately flirted. The little coquetteries, which are as natural to a gay young girl as her laughter, were all in full play and had she gone no further, no harm would have been done. But, excited by the example of those about her, Kitty tried to enact the fashionable young lady, and, like most novices, she overdid the part. Quite forgetting her cousin, she tossed her head, twirled her fan, gave affected little shrieks at college jokes, and talked college slang in a way that convulsed Fletcher, who enjoyed the fun immensely. Jack saw it all, shook his head and said nothing, but his face grew rather sober as he watched Kitty, flushed, disheveled, and breathless, whirling round Lyceum Hall on the arm of Fletcher, who danced divinely as all the girls agreed. Jack had proposed going, but Kitty had frowned, so he fell back, leaving her to listen and laugh blush and shrink a little at her partner's flowery compliments and admiring glances. "'If she stands that long, she's not the girl I took her for,' thought Jack, beginning to lose patience. "'She doesn't look like my little kitty, and somehow I don't feel half so fond and proud of her as usual. I know one thing. My daughter shall never be seen knocking about in that style.' As if the thought suggested the act, Jack suddenly assumed an air of parental authority, and, arresting his cousin as she was about to begin again, he said, in a tone she had never heard before, "'I promised Pris to take care of you, so I shall carry you off to rest and put yourself to rights after this game of romps. I advise you to do the same, Fletcher, or give your friend in the pink bonnet a turn.' Kitty took Jack's arm pettishly but glanced over her shoulder with such an inviting smile that Fletcher followed, feeling very much like a top, in danger of tumbling down the instant he stopped spinning. As she came out, Kitty's face cleared, and assuming her sprightliest air, she spread her plumage and prepared to descend with effect, for a party of uninvited Paris stood at the gate of this paradise, casting longing glances at the forbidden splendors within. Slowly, that all might see her, Kitty sailed down with Horace, the debonair, in her wake, and was just thinking to herself, those girls won't get over this very soon, I fancy, when all in one moment she heard Fletcher exclaim wrathfully, hang the flounces. She saw a very glossy black hat come skipping down the steps, felt a violent twitch backward, and, to save herself from a fall, sat down on the lower step with most undignified haste. 
It was impossible for the bystanders to help laughing, for there was Fletcher hopping wildly about, with one foot nicely caught in a muslin loop, and there sat Kitty, longing to run away and hide herself, yet perfectly helpless, while everyone tittered. Miss Jones and Miss Smith laughed shrilly, and the despised little freshman completed her mortification by a feeble joke about Kitty Heath's new man-trap. It was only an instant, but it seemed an hour before Fletcher freed her, and snatching up the dusty beaver, left her with a flushed countenance and an abrupt bow. If it hadn't been for Jack, Kitty would have burst into tears then and there, so terrible was the sense of humiliation which oppressed her. For his sake she controlled herself, and bundling up her torn train, set her teeth, stared straight before her, and let him lead her in dead silence to a friend's room nearby. There he locked the door, and began to comfort her by making light of the little mishap. But Kitty cried so tragically that he was at his wit's end, till the ludicrous side of the affair struck her, and she began to laugh hysterically, with a vague idea that vigorous treatment was best for that feminine ailment. Jack was about to empty the contents of an ice pitcher over her, when she arrested him by exclaiming incoherently, "'Oh, don't! It was so funny! How can you laugh, you cruel boy? I'm disgraced forever! Take me home to Pris! Oh, take me home to Pris!' "'I will, my dear, I will. But first let me write you up a bit. You look as if you had been hazed. Upon my life you do!' And Jack laughed, in spite of himself, at the wretched little object before him, for dust, dancing, and the downfall produced a ruinous spectacle. That broke Kitty's heart, and spreading her hands before her face, she was about to cry again, when the sad sight which met her eyes dispelled the gathering tears. The new gloves were both split up the middle, and very dirty with clutching at the steps as she went down. "'Never mind, you can wash them,' said Jack soothingly. "'I paid a dollar and a half for them, and they can't be washed,' groaned Kitty. "'Oh, hang the gloves! I meant your hands!' cried Jack, trying to keep sober. "'No matter for my hands. I mourn my gloves. But I won't cry any more, for my head aches now so I can hardly see.' And Kitty threw off her bonnet as if even that airy trifle hurt her. Seeing how pale she looked, Jack tenderly suggested a rest on the old sofa and a wet handkerchief on her hot forehead, while he got the good landlady to send her up a cup of tea. As Kitty rose to comply, she glanced at her dress, and clasping her hands exclaimed tragically, "'The facing! The fatal facing! That made all the mischief! for if I'd sewed it up last night it wouldn't have ripped today. If it hadn't ripped, Fletcher wouldn't have got his foot in it. I shouldn't have made an object of myself, and he wouldn't have gone off in a rage, and who knows what might have happened." "'Bless the what's-its-name if it has settled him,' cried Jack. He is a contemptible fellow not to stay and help you out of the scrape he got you into. Follow his lead and don't trouble yourself about him." Well, he was rather absurd today, I allow, but he has got handsome eyes and hands, and he does dance like an angel," sighed Kitty, as she pinned up the treacherous loop which had brought destruction to her little castle in the air. Handsome eyes, white hands, and angelic feet don't make a man. Wait till you can do better, Kit. With an odd, grave look that rather startled Kitty. Jack vanished, to return presently with a comfortable cup of tea and a motherly old lady to help repair damages and soothe her by the foolish little purrings and pattings so grateful to female nerves after a flurry. "'I'll come back and take you out to see the dance round the tree when you've had a bit of a rest,' said Jack, vibrating between door and sofa, as if it wasn't easy to get away. "'Oh, I couldn't!' cried Kitty, with a shudder at the bare idea of meeting anyone. 
I can't be seen again tonight. Let me stay here till my train goes. I thought it had gone already, said Jack with an irrepressible twinkle of the eye that glanced at the draggled dress sweeping the floor. How can you joke about it? And the girl's reproachful eyes filled with tears of shame. I know I've been very silly, Jack, but I've had my punishment, and I don't need any more. To feel that you despise me is worse than all the rest." She ended with a little sob, and turned her face away to hide the trembling of her lips. At that, Jack flushed up, his eyes shone, and he stooped suddenly as if to make some impetuous reply. But, remembering the old lady, who by the by was discreetly looking out of the window, he put his hands in his pockets and strolled out of the room. I've lost them both by this day's folly, thought Kitty, and Mrs. Brown departed with the teacup. I don't care for Fletcher, for I dare say he didn't mean half he said, and I was only flattered because he is rich and handsome and the girls glorify him. But I shall miss Jack, for I've known and loved him all my life. How good he's been to me today, so patient, careful, and kind though he must have been ashamed of me. I know he didn't like my dress, but he never said a word and stood by me through everything. Oh, I wish I'd minded Pris. Then he would have respected me at least. I wonder if he ever will again." Following a sudden impulse, Kitty sprang up, locked the door, and then proceeded to destroy all her little vanities as far as possible. She smoothed out her crimps with a wet and ruthless hand, fastened up her pretty hair in the simple way Jack liked, gave her once cherished bonnet a spiteful shake as she put it on, and utterly extinguished it with a big blue veil. She looped up her dress, leaving no vestige of the now hateful train, and did herself up uncompromisingly in the Quakerish gray shawl Pris had insisted on her taking for the evening. Then she surveyed herself with pensive satisfaction, saying, in the tone of one bent on resolutely mortifying the flesh, Neat, but not gaudy. I'm a fright, but I deserve it. And it's better than being a peacock. Kitty had time to feel a little friendless and forlorn, sitting there alone as twilight fell and amused herself by wondering if Fletcher would come to inquire about her or show any further interest in her. Yet, when the sound of a manly tramp approached, she trembled lest it should be the victim of the fatal facing. The door opened, and with a sigh of relief she saw Jack come in, bearing a pair of new gloves in one hand and a great bouquet of June roses in the other. How good of you to bring me these! They are more refreshing than oceans of tea. You know what I like, Jack. Thank you very much," cried Kitty, sniffing at her roses with grateful rapture. And you know what I like," returned Jack, with an approving glance at the altered figure before him. I'll never do so any more," murmured Kitty, wondering why she felt bashful all of a sudden, when it was only Cousin Jack. Now put on your gloves, dear, and come out and hear the music. Your train doesn't go for two hours yet, and you mustn't mope here all that time," said Jack, offering his second gift. How did you know my size? asked Kitty, putting on the gloves in a hurry. For though Jack had called her dear for years, the little word had a new sound tonight. I guessed. No, I didn't. I had the old ones with me. They are no good now, are they?" And too honest to lie, Jack tried to speak carelessly, though he turned red in the dusk, well knowing that the dirty little gloves were folded away in his left breast pocket at that identical moment. Oh, dear, no! These fit nicely. I'm ready if you don't mind going with such a fright," said Kitty forgetting her dread of seeing people in her desire to get away from that room, because for the first time in her life she wasn't at ease with Jack. 
"'I think I like the little gray moth better than the fine butterfly,' returned Jack, who, in spite of his invitation, seemed to find moping rather pleasant. "'You are a rainy-day friend, and he isn't,' said Kitty softly, as she drew him away. Jack's only answer was to lay his hand on the little white glove resting so confidingly on his arm, and keeping it there, they roamed away into the summer twilight. Something had happened to the evening and the place, for both seemed suddenly endowed with uncommon beauty and interest. The dingy old houses might have been fairy palaces for anything they saw to the contrary. The dusty walks, the trampled grass, were regular Elysian fields to them. And the music was the music of the spheres, though they found themselves right in the middle of the boom-jing-jing. Jing. For both had made a little discovery. No, not a little one. The greatest and sweetest man and woman can make. In the sharp twinge of jealousy which the sight of Kitty's flirtation with Fletcher gave him, and the delight he found in her after-conduct, Jack discovered how much he loved her. In the shame, gratitude, and half-sweet, half-bitter emotion that filled her heart, Kitty felt that to her Jack would never be only Cousin Jack any more. All the vanity, coquetry, selfishness, and ill-temper of the day seemed magnified to heinous sins. For now her only thought was, Seeing these faults, he can't care for me. Oh, I wish I was a better girl. She did not say for his sake, but in the new humility, the ardent wish to be all that a woman should be, little Kitty proved how true her love was, and might have said with Portia, For myself alone, I would not be ambitious in my wish, but for you, I would be troubled twenty times myself, a thousand times more fair, ten thousand times more rich. All about them, other pairs were wandering under the patriarchal elms, enjoying music, starlight, balmy winds, and all the luxuries of the season. If the band had played, oh, there's nothing half so sweet in life as love's young dream, it is my private opinion that it would have suited the audience to a tea. Being principally composed of elderly gentlemen with large families, they had not that fine sense of the fitness of things so charming to see, and tooted and banged away with waltzes and marches, quite regardless of the flocks of Romeos and Juliets philandering all about them. Under cover of a popular medley, Kitty overheard Fletcher quizzing her for the amusement of Miss Pinkbonnet, who was evidently making up for lost time. It was feeble wit, but it put the finishing stroke to Kitty's vanity, and she dropped a tear in her blue tissue retreat and clung to Jack, feeling that she had never valued him half enough. She hoped he didn't hear the gossip going on at the other side of the tree near which they stood, but he did, for his hand involuntarily doubled itself up into a very dangerous-looking fist, and he darted such fiery glances at the speaker that, if the thing had been possible, Fletcher's ambrosial curls would have been scorched off his head. Never mind, and don't get angry, Jack. They are right about one thing. The daisies in my bonnet were real, and I couldn't afford any others. I don't care much. Only Pris worked so hard to get me ready I hate to have my things made fun of. He isn't worth a thrashing, so we'll let it pass this time, said Jack, irefully, yet privately resolving to have it out with Fletcher by and by. Why, Kitty, I thought the real daisies the prettiest things about your dress. Don't throw them away. I'll wear them just to show that noodle that I prefer nature to art and Jack gallantly stuck the faded posy in his buttonhole, while Kitty treasured up the hint so kindly given for future use. If a clock, with great want of tact, hadn't insisted on telling them that it was getting late, Kitty never would have got home, 
for both the young people felt inclined to loiter about arm in arm through the sweet summer night forever. Jack had meant to say something before she went, and was immensely surprised to find the chance lost for the present. He wanted to go home with her and free his mind, but a neighborly old gentleman, having been engaged as escort, there would have been very little satisfaction in traveling trio. So he gave it up. He was very silent as they walked to the station with Mr. Dodd trudging behind them. Kitty thought he was tired, perhaps glad to be rid of her, and meekly accepted her fate. But as the train approached, she gave his hand an impulsive squeeze and said very gratefully, "'Jack, I can't thank you enough for your kindness to your silly little cousin, but I never shall forget it, and if I can ever return it in any way, I will, with all my heart.' Jack looked down at the young face, almost pathetic now, with weariness, humility, and pain, yet very sweet with that new shyness in the loving eyes, and stooping suddenly he kissed it, whispering in a tone that made the girl's heart flutter. I'll tell you how you may return it, with all your heart, by and by. Good night, my kitty. Have you had a good time, dear? asked Pris, as her sister appeared an hour later. Don't I look as if I had? and throwing off her wraps, Kitty revolved slowly before her that she might behold every portion of the wreck. My gown is all dust, crumple, and rags, my bonnet perfectly limp and flat, and my gloves are ruined. I've broken Lizzie's parasol and made a spectacle of myself, and wasted money, time, and temper. Yet my class day isn't a failure, for Jack is the dearest boy in the world and I'm very, very happy." Pris looked at her a minute, then opened her arms without a word, and Kitty forgot all her little troubles in one great joy. When Miss Smith and Miss Jones called a few days after to tell her that Mr. Fletcher was going abroad, the amiable creatures were entirely routed by finding Jack there in a most unmistakable situation. He blandly wished Horace bon voyage, and regretted that he wouldn't be there to the wedding in October. Kitty devoted herself to blushing beautifully, and darning many rents in a short daisy muslin skirt, which I intend to wear a great deal, because Jack likes it, and so do I, she said, with a demure look at her lover, who laughed as if that was the best joke of the season. End of Kitty's Class Day The Lifted Bandage by Mary Raymond Shipman Andrews This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan. The Lifted Bandage by Mary Raymond Shipman Andrews. The man let himself into his front door, and staggering lightly, like a drunken man as he crossed it, walked to the hall table, and mechanically laid down his hat, but still wearing his overcoat, turned and went into his library and dropped on the edge of a divan, and stared out through the leaded panes of glass across the room facing him. The grayish skin of his face seemed to fall in diagonal furrows, from the eyes, from the nose, from the mouth. He sat, still to his fingertips, staring. He was sitting so when a servant slipped in, and stood motionless a minute and went to the wide window where the west light glared through leafless branches outside, and drew the shades lower, and went to the fireplace and touched a match. Wood caught and crackled, and a cheerful orange flame 
flew noisily up the chimney. But the man sitting on the divan did not notice. The butler waited a moment, watching, hesitating, and then, "'Have you had lunch, sir?' he asked, in a tentative, gentle voice. The staring eyes moved with an effort and rested on the servant's face. "'Lunch,' he repeated, apparently trying to focus on the meaning of the word. "'Lunch? I don't know, Miller, but don't bring anything.' With a great anxiety in his face, Miller regarded his master. "'Would you let me take your overcoat, Judge? You'll be too warm,' he said. He spoke in a suppressed tone, as if waiting for, fearing something, as if longing to show sympathy, and the man stood and let himself be cared for, and then sat down again in the same unrestful, fixed attitude gazing out again through the glittering panes into the stormy, tawny west sky. Miller came back and stood quiet, patient. In a few minutes the man seemed to become aware of him. "'I forgot, Miller. You'll want to know,' he said in a tone which went to show an old bond between the two. "'You'll be sorry to hear, Miller,' he said and the dull eyes moved difficultly to the anxious ones, and his voice was uninflected. You'll be sorry to know that the coroner's jury decided that Master Jack was a murderer. The word came out more horribly, because of an air of detachment from the man's mind. It was like a soulless, evil mechanism, running unguided. Miller caught at a chair. I don't believe it, sir. No lawyer shall make me. I've known him since he was ten, Judge, and they're mistaken. It's not any mere lawyers can make me believe that awful thing, sir, of our Master Jack. The servant was shaking from head to foot with intense rejection, and the old man put up his hand as if to ward off this emotion. I wish I could agree with you, he said quietly, and then added, Thank you, Miller and the old butler, walking as if struck with a sickness, was gone. The man sat on the edge of the divan, staring out the window, minute after minute. The November wind tossed the clean black lines of the branches backward and forward against the copper sky, as if a giant hand moved a fan of seaweed before a fire. The man sat still and stared. The sky dulled. The delicate wild branches melted together. The diamond lines in the window blurred, yet unmoved, unseeing. The eyes stared through them. The burr of an electric bell sounded. Someone came in at the front door and came to the door of the library. But the fixed figure did not stir. The newcomer stood silent a minute, two minutes. A young man in clerical dress, boyish, with gray, serious eyes. At length he spoke. May I come in? It's Dick. The man's head turned slowly, and his look rested inquiring on his nephew. It was a minute before he said, as if recognizing him, Dick, yes, and set himself as before to the persistent gazing through the window. I lost you at the courthouse, the younger man said. I didn't mean to let you come home alone. Thank you, Dick. It seemed as if neither joy nor sorrow would find a way into the quiet voice again. The wind roared, the boughs rustled against the glass, the fire soberly settled to work, steamed and crackled, the clock ticked indifferently. There was no other sound in the room. The two men were silent, the one staring always before him, the other sitting with a hand on the older man's hand, waiting. Minutes they sat so, and the wintry sky outside darkened, and lay sullenly in bands of gray and orange against the windows. The light of the logs was stronger than the daylight. 
It flickered carelessly across the ashiness of the emotionless face. The young man, watching the face, bent forward and gripped his other hand on the unresponsive one in his clasp. Uncle, he asked, will it make things worse if I talk to you? No, Dick. Nothing made a difference, it seemed. Silence or words must simply fall without effect on the rock bottom of despair. The young man halted, as if dismayed. Before this overpowering inertia of hopelessness, he drew a quick breath. A coroner's jury isn't infallible. I don't believe it of Jack. A lot of people don't believe it, he said. The older man looked at him heavily. You'd say that. Jack's friends will. I've been trained to weigh evidence. I must believe it. Listen, the young man urged. Don't shut down the gates like that. I'm not a lawyer, but I've been trained to think, too. And I believe you're not thinking squarely. There's other evidence that counts besides this. There's Jack, his personality. It has been taken into consideration. It can't be taken into consideration by strangers. It needs years of intimacy to weigh that evidence as I weigh it, as you. You know the best of all, he cried out impulsively. If you'll let yourself know how impossible it was that Jack should have bought that pistol and taken it to Ben Armstrong's room to kill him. It was impossible. Impossible. The clenched fist came down on the black broadcloth knee with the conviction of the man behind it. The words rushed like melted metal, hot, stinging, not to be stopped. The judge quivered as if they had stung through the callousness, touched a nerve. A faint color crawled to his cheeks. For the first time he spoke quickly, as if his thoughts connected with something more than the gray matter. You talk about my not allowing myself to believe in Jack. You seem to realize that such a belief would, might, stand between me and madness. I've been trying to adjust myself to a possible scheme of living, getting through the years till I go into nothingness. I can't. All I can grasp is the feeling that a man might have if dropped from a balloon and forced to stay gasping in the air with no place in it, nothing to hold to, no breath to draw, no earth to rest on, no end to hope for. There is nothing beyond. Everything is beyond, the young man cried triumphantly. The end, as you call it, is an end to hope for. It is the beginning the beginning of more than you have ever had with them, with the people you care about. The judge turned a ghastly look on the impetuous bright face. If I believe that, I should be even now perfectly happy. I don't see how you Christians can ever be sorry when your friends die. It's childish. Anybody ought to be able to wait a few years. But I don't believe it, he said heavily and went on again, as if an inertia of speech were carrying him, as an inertia of silence had held him a few minutes before. When my wife died a year ago, it ended my personal life, but I could live Jack's life. I was glad in the success and honor of it. Now the success, he made a gesture, and the honor, if I had that, only the honor of Jack's life left, I think I could finish the years with dignity. I've not been a bad man. I've done my part and lived as seemed right. Before I'm old, the joy is wiped out and long years left. Why? It's not reasonable, not logical. With one thing to hold to, with Jack's good name, I might live. How can I now? What can I do? A life must have raison d'etre. Listen, the clergyman cried again. You are not judging Jack as fairly as you would judge a common criminal. You know better than I how often juries make mistakes. Why should you trust this jury to have made none? I didn't trust the jury. I watched, as I have never known before how to watch a case. I felt my mind more clear and alert than common. 
Alert, he caught at the word, but alert on the side of terror, abnormally clear to see what you dreaded. Because you are fair-minded, because it has been the habit of your life to correct at once any conscious prejudice in your judgment, you have swayed to the side of unfairness to yourself, to Jack. Uncle, he flashed out, would it tear your soul to have me state the case as I see it? I might, you know, I might bring out something that would make it look different. Almost a smile touched the gray lines of his face. If you wish. The young man drew himself into his chair and clasped his hands around his knee. Here it is. Mr. Newbold, on the seventh floor of the Bruzon Bachelor Apartments, heard a shot at one in the morning, next to his bedroom in Ben Armstrong's room. He hurried into the public hall, saw the door wide open into Ben's apartment, went in, and found Ben shot dead. Trying to use the telephone to call help, he found it was out of order. So he rushed again into the hall toward the elevator with the idea of getting Dr. Avery who lived below on the second floor. The elevator door was open also, and a man's opera hat lay near it on the floor. He saw, just in time, that the car was at the bottom of the shaft. Almost stepping inside in his excitement, before he noticed this. Then he ran down the stairs with Jack's hat in his hand and got Dr. Avery, and they found Jack at the foot of the elevator shaft. It was known that Ben Armstrong and Jack had quarreled the day before. It was known that Jack was quick-tempered. It is known that he bought that evening the pistol which was found on the floor by Ben, loaded with one empty shell. That's the story. The steady voice stopped a moment, and the young man shivered slightly. His look was strained. Steadily, he went on. That's the story. From that, the coroner's jury have found that Jack killed Ben Armstrong, that he bought the pistol to kill him, and went to his rooms with that purpose, that in his haste to escape, he missed seeing that the elevator was down. As Mr. Newbold all but missed seeing it later, and jumped into the shaft, and was killed instantly himself. That's what the jury get from the facts, but it seems to me they're begging the question. There are a hundred hypotheses that would fit the case of Jack's innocence. Why is it that reasonable to settle on the one that means his guilt? This is my idea. Jack and Ben Armstrong had been friends since boyhood, and Jack, quick-tempered as he was, was warm-hearted and loyal. It was like him to decide suddenly to go to Ben and make friends. He had been to a play in the evening which had more or less that motif. He was open to such influences. It was like the pair of them, after the reconciliation, to set to work looking at Jack's new toy, the pistol. It was a brand new sort, and the two have been interested always in guns. I remember how I, as a youngster, was impressed when Ben and Jack bought their first shotguns together. Jack had got the pistol at Mellingham's that evening, you know. He was likely to be keen about it still, and then it went off. There are plenty of other cases where a man has shot his friend by accident. Why shouldn't poor Jack be given the benefit of the doubt? The telephone wouldn't work. Jack rushed out with the same idea which struck Mr. Newbold later of getting Dr. Avery, and fell down the shaft. For me there is no doubt. I never knew him to hold malice. He was violent sometimes, but that he could have gone about it for hours with a pistol in his pocket and murder in his heart, that he could have planned Ben Armstrong's death and carried it out deliberately, it's a contradiction in terms. It's impossible being Jack. You must know this. You know your son. You know human nature. The rapid resume was but an impassioned appeal. Its answer came after a minute to the torrent of eager words, three words, thank you, Dick. The absolute lack of impression on the man's judgment was plain. Ah, the clergyman sprang to his feet and stood, his eyes blazing despairingly, 
looking down at the bent, listless figure. How could he let a human being suffer as this one was suffering? Quickly his thoughts shifted their basis. He could not affect the mind of the lawyer. Might he reach now, perhaps, the soul of the man? He knew the difficulty, for before this his belief had crossed with swords with the, with the agnosticism of his uncle, an agnosticism shared by his father, in which he had been trained, from which he had broken free only five years before. He had faced the batteries of the two older brains at that time, and come out with the brightness of his newfound faith untarnished, but without, he remembered, scratching the armor of their profound doubt in everything. One could see, looking at the slender black figure, at the visionary gaze of the wide gray eyes, at the shape of the face, broad bowed, ovaled, that this man's psychic makeup must lift him like wings into an atmosphere outside a material, outside even an intellectual world. He could breathe freely only in a spiritual air, and things hard to believe to most human beings were, perhaps, his everyday thoughts. He caught a quick breath of excitement as it flashed to his brain that now, possibly, was coming the movement when he might justify his life, might help this man whom he loved to peace. The breath he caught was a prayer. His strong, nervous fingers trembled. He spoke in a tone whose concentration lifted the eyes below him that brooded, stared. I can't bear it to stand by and see you go under when there's help close. You said that if you could believe that they were living, that you would have them again. You would be perfectly happy no matter how many years you must wait. They are living as sure as I am here, as sure as Jack was here, and Jack's mother. They are living still. Perhaps they're close to you now. You've bound a bandage over your eyes. You've covered the vision of your spirit so that you can't see. But that doesn't make nothingness of God's world. It's there, here, close maybe. A more real world than this, this little thing. With a boyish gesture, he thrust behind him the universe. What do we know about the earth except effects upon our consciousness? It's all a matter of interference. You know that better than I. The thing we do know beyond doubt is that we are each of us something that suffers and is happy. How is that something the same as the body, the body that gets old and dies? How can it be? You can't change thought into matter, not conceivably. Everybody acknowledges that. Why should the thinking part die then? Because the material part dies. When the organ is broken, is the organist dead? The body is the hull, the covering, and when it has grown useless, it will fall away, and the live seed in it will stand free to sunlight and air, just at the beginning of life, as a plant is when it breaks through earth in the spring. It's the seed in the ground, and it's the flower in the sunlight, but it's the same thing, the same life. It is. It is. The boy's intensity of conviction shot like a flame across the quiet room. It's the same thing with us, too. The same spirit substance underlies both worlds, and there is no separation in space, only in viewpoint. Life goes on. It's just transfigured. It's as if a bandage should be lifted from our eyes, and we should suddenly see things in whose presence we had been always. The rushing, eager voice stopped. He bent and laid his hand on the older man's and stared at his face, half hidden now in the shadows of the lowering fire. There was no response. The heavy head did not lift and the attitude was unstirred, hopeless. As if struck by a blow, he sprang erect and his fingers shut hard. He spoke as if to himself brokenly. He does not believe a single word I say. I can't help him. I can't help him. Suddenly the clinched fists 
flung out, as if of a power not their own, and his voice rang across the room. God! The word shot from him as if a thunderbolt fell with it. God, lift the bandage! A log fell with a crash into the fire. Great battling shadows blurred all the air. He was gone. The man, startled, drew up his bent shoulders and pushed back a lock of gray hair and stared about, shaking, bewildered. The ringing voice, the word that had flashed as if out of a larger atmosphere. The place was yet full of these, and the shock of it added a keenness to his misery. His figure swung sideways. He fell on the cushions of the sofa, and his arms stretched across them, his gray head lying heedless. Sobs that tore roots came painfully. It was the last depth. Out of it, without his volition, he spoke out loud. God, 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 his voice said, not prayerfully, but repeating the sound that had shocked his torture. The word wailed, mocked, reproached, defied, and yet it was a prayer. Out of a soul in mortal stress, that word comes, sometimes driven by a force of the spirit, like the force of the lungs fighting for breath, and it is a prayer. God, 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 the broken voice repeated, and sobs cut the words, and again, over and over, and the sobbing broke it. As suddenly as if a knife had stopped the life inside the body, all sound stopped. Of movement shook the man as he lay face down, arms stretched. Then for a minute, two minutes. He was quiet, with a quiet that meant muscles stretched, nerves alert. Slowly, slowly the tightened muscles of the arms pushed the shoulders backward and upward. The head lifted, the face turned outward, and if an observer had been there, he might have seen by the glow of the firelight that the features wet, distorted, wore, more than all at this moment, a look of amazement. Slowly, slowly moving as if afraid to disturb something, a dream, a presence. The man sat erect as he had been sitting before, only that the rigidity was in some way gone. He sat alert, his eyes wide, filled with astonishment gazing before him eagerly, a look different from the dull stare of an hour ago, by the difference between hope and despair, his hands caught at the stuff of the divan on either side and clutched it. All the time the look on his face changed, all the time, not at once, but by fast, startling degrees, the gray misery which had bound eyes and mouth and brow in iron dropped, as if a cover were being torn off and a light set free. Amazement, doubting, incredulous came first, and with that eagerness, trembling and afraid, and then hope, and then the fear to hope, and hunger. He bent forward, his eyes peered into the quiet emptiness, his fingers gripped the cloth as if to anchor him to a wonder to an unbelievable something. His body leaned to something, and his face was now the face of a starved man, of a man dying from thirst, who sees food, water, salvation. And his face changed. A quality incredible was coming into it. Joy. He was transformed. Lines softened by magic. Color came, and light in the eyes. The first unbelief, the amazement, shifted surely, swiftly, and in a flash the whole man shone, shook with rapture. He threw out before him his arms, reaching, clasping, and from his radiant look the arms might have held all happiness. 
A minute he stayed so with his hands stretched out, with face glowing. Then slowly, his eyes straining as if perhaps they followed a vision which faded from them, slowly his arms fell, and the expectancy went from his look. Yet not the light, not the joy. His body quivered, his breath came unevenly, as of one just gone through a crisis. Every sense seemed still alive to catch a faintest note of something exquisite which vanished, and with that the spell, rapidly as it had come, was gone. And the man sat there quiet as he had sat an hour before, and the face which had been leaden was brilliant. He stirred and glanced about the room as if trying to adjust himself, and his eyes smiled as they rested on the familiar objects, as if for love of them, for pleasure in them. One might have said that this man had been given back, at a blow, youth and happiness. Movement seemed beyond him yet. He was yet dazed with the newness of a marvel. But he turned his head and saw the fire and at that put out his hand to it as if to a friend. The electric bell burred softly again through the house, and the man heard it, and his eyes rested inquiringly on the door of the library. In a moment another man stood there, of his own age, iron-gray, strong-featured. Dick told me I might come, he said. Shall I trouble you? May I stay with you a while? The judge put out his hand, friendly, a little vaguely, much as he had put it out to the fire. Surely, he said, and the newcomer was all at once aware of his look. He started. You're not well, he said. You must take something. Whiskey. Miller? The butler moved in the room, making lights here and there, and came quickly. No, said the judge. I don't want anything. I don't need anything. It's not as you think. I'll tell you about it. Miller was gone. Dick's father waited, his gaze fixed on the judge's face, anxiously, and for moments no word was spoken. The judge gazed into the fire with the rapt, smiling look which had so startled his brother-in-law. At length, I don't know how to tell you, he said. There seem no words. Something has happened, yet it's difficult to explain. Something happened, the other repeated, bewildered, but guarded. I don't understand. Has someone been here? Is it about the trial? No. A slight spasm twisted the smiling lines of the man's mouth, but it was gone, and the mouth smiled still. A horror-struck expression gleamed for a second from the anxious eyes of the brother-in-law, but he controlled it quickly. He spoke gently. Tell me about it. It will do you good to talk. The judge turned from the fire, and at sight of his flushed cheeks and lighted eyes, the other shrank back, and the judge saw it. You needn't be alarmed, he said quietly. Nothing is wrong with me, but something has happened, as I told you, and everything is changed. His eyes lifted as he spoke and strayed about the room, as if considering a change which had come also to the accustomed setting. A shock of pity flashed from the other, and was mastered at once. Can you tell me what has happened, he urged? The judge, his face bright with a brightness that was dreadful to the man who watched him, held his hand to the fire, turning it about as if enjoying the warmth. The other shivered. There was silence for a minute. The judge broke it, speaking thoughtfully. Suppose you had been born blind, Ned, he began, and no one had ever given you a hint of the sense of vision, and your imagination had never presented such a power to your mind. Can you suppose that? I think so, yes, the brother-in-law answered, 
with careful gentleness, watching always the illumined countenance. Yes, I can suppose it. Then fancy, if you will, that all at once sight came, and the world flashed before you. Do you think you'd be able to describe such an experience? The voice was normal, reflective. Many a time the two had talked together of such things in this very room, and the naturalness of the scene, and of the judge's manner, made the brother-in-law for a second forget the tragedy in which they were living. Why, of course, he answered, if one had never heard of such a power, one's vocabulary wouldn't take in the words to describe it. Exactly, the judge agreed. That's the point I'm making. Perhaps now I may tell you what it is that has happened, or rather, I may make you understand how a definite and concrete event has come to pass, which I can't tell you. Alarm suddenly expressed itself beyond control in the brother-in-law's face. John, what do you mean? Do you see that you distress me? Can't you tell me clearly if someone has been here what it is, in plain English, that has happened? The judge turned his dreamy, bright look to the frightened man. I do see. I do see, he brought out affectionately. I'll try to tell, as you say, in plain English, but it is like the case I put. It is a question of lack of vocabulary. A remarkable experience has occurred in this room within an hour. I can no more describe it than the blind man could describe sight. I can call it by only one name, which may startle you, a revelation. A revelation? The tone expressed incredulity, scarcely veiled scorn. The judge's brilliant gaze rested undisturbed on the speaker. I understand none better. A day ago, two hours ago, I should have answered in that tone. We have been trained in the same school, and have thought alike. Dick was here a while ago and said things. You know what Dick would say. You know how you and I have been sorry for the lad, been indulgent to him, with his keen, broad mind, and that inspired self-forgetfulness of his. How we've been sorry to have such qualities wasted on a parson, a religion machine. We've thought he'd come around in time that he was too large a personality to be tied to a treadmill. We've thought that all along, haven't we? Well, Dick was here, and out of the hell where I was, I thought that again. When we talked, I thought in a way, for I couldn't think much, and that after a consistent voyage of agnosticism, I wouldn't be whipped into a sniveling belief at the end by shipwreck. I would at least go down without surrendering, in a dim way I thought that, and all that I thought then and have thought through my life is nothing. Reasoning doesn't weigh against experience. Dick is right. The other man sat before him, bent forward, his hands on his knees, listening, dazed. There was a quality in the speaker's tone which made it necessary to take his words seriously. Yet the other side and relaxed a bit as he waited, watched. The calm voice went on. The largest event of my life has happened in the last hour in this room. It was this way. When Dick went out, I went utterly to pieces. It was the farthest depth. Out of it I called on God, not knowing what I did, and he answered. That's what happened. As if as if a bandage had been lifted from my eyes. I was, I was in the presence of things, indescribable. There was no change, only that where I was blind before, I now saw. I don't mean vision. I haven't words to explain what I mean. But a world was about me as real as this. It had perhaps always been there. In that moment, I was first aware of it. I knew, as if a door had been opened, what heaven means, a condition of being. I knew another thing more personal, 
that, without question, it was right with those I thought I had lost, and that the horror which seemed blackest I have no need to dread. I cannot say that I saw them, or heard, or touched them, but I was with them. I understand, but I can't make you understand. I told Dick an hour ago that if I could believe they were living, that I should ever have them again, I should be perfectly happy. That's true now. I believe it, and I am perfectly happy. The listener groaned uncontrollably. I know your thought, the judge answered the sound, and his eyes were like lamps as he turned them toward the man. But you're wrong. My mind is not unhinged, you'll see. After what I've gone through, after facing eternity without hope, what are mere years? I can wait. I know. I am perfectly happy. Then the man who listened rose from his chair and came, and put a hand gently on the shoulder of the judge, looking down at him gravely. I don't understand you very well, John, he said, but I'm glad of anything, of anything. His voice went suddenly. Will you wait for me here a few minutes? I'm going home and I'll be back. I think I'll spend the night with you if you don't object. Object? Wait! The judge looked up in surprise, and with that he smiled. I see. Surely, I'd like to have you here. Yes, certainly I'll wait. Outside in the hall, one might have heard the brother-in-law say a low word or two to Miller, as the man helped him on with his coat. Then the front door shut softly, and he was gone. Had the judge sat alone, his head thrown back against his chair, his face luminous. The other man swung down the dark street, rushing, agitated. As he came to the corner, an electric light shone full on him, and a figure crossing down toward him halted. Father, I was coming to find you. Something extraordinary has happened. I was coming to find you. Yes, Dick. The older man waited. I've just left Charlie Owen at the house. You remember Charlie Owen? No. Oh, yes, you do. He's been here with Jack. He was in Jack's class in college, in Jack's and Ben Armstrong's. He used to go on shooting trips with them both, often. I remember now. Yes, I knew you would. His voice rushed on. He has been away just now, down in Florida, shooting, away from civilization. He got all his mail for a month in one lump, just now, two days ago. In it was a letter from Jack and Ben Armstrong, written that night, written together. Do you see what that means? What? The word was not a question, but an exclamation. What, Dick? Yes. There were newspapers, too, which gave an account of the trial. The first he'd heard it. He was away in the Everglades. He started instantly and came on here when he read the papers, and realized the bearing his letter would have on the trial. He has traveled day and night. He hoped to get here in time. Jack and Ben thought he was in New York. They wrote to ask him to go duck shooting with them. And father, here's the most startling point of it all. As the man waited, watching his son's face, he groaned suddenly and made a gesture of despair. Don't, father, don't take it that way. It's good. It's glorious. It clears Jack. My uncle will be almost happy. But I wouldn't tell him at once. I'd be careful, he warned the other. What was it, the startling point you spoke of? Oh, surely this. The letter to Charlie Owen spoke of Jack's new pistol. That pistol. Jack said they would have target shooting with it in camp. They were all crack shots, you know. He said he had bought it that evening, and that Ben thought well of it. Ben signed the letter after Jack and then added a postscript. It clears Jack. It clears him, doesn't it, Father? But I wouldn't tell my uncle just yet. He's not fit to take it in for a few hours. Don't you think so? No, I wouldn't tell him just yet. The young man's wide glance concentrated with a flash on his father's face. What is it? You speak queerly. You've just come from there. How is he? How is my uncle? There was a letter box at the corner a foot from the old man's shoulder. He put out his hand 
and held to the lid a moment before he answered. His voice was harsh. Your uncle is perfectly happy, he said. He's gone mad. End of the Lifted Bandage Recording by Alana Jordan by Anton Chekhov Translated by Constance Garnett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Misery by Anton Chekhov To whom should I tell my grief? The twilight of evening. Big flakes of white snow are whirling lazily about the street lamps, which have just been lighted, and lying in a thin, soft layer of roofs, horses' backs, shoulders, caps. Iona Potapov, the sledge driver, is all white like a ghost. He sits on the box without stirring, bent as double as the living body can be bent. If a regular snowfall fell on him, it seems as though even then he would not think it necessary to shake it off. His little mare is white and motionless, too. Her stillness, the angularity of her lines, the stick-like straightness of her legs, make her look like a halfpenny gingerbread horse. She is probably lost in thought. Anyone who has been torn away from the plough, from the familiar grey landscapes, and cast into this slough, full of monstrous lights, of unceasing uproar and hurrying people, is bound to think. It is a long time since Iona and his nag have budged. They came out of the yard before dinner-time, and not a single fare yet. But now the shades of evening are falling on the town. The pale light of the street lamps changes to a vivid color, and the bustle of the streets grows noisier. Sledge to Viborgskaya, Iona hears. Sledge! Iona starts, and through his snow-plastered eyelashes sees an officer in a military overcoat, with a hood over his head. To Viborgskaya, repeats the officer. Are you asleep? To Viborgskaya! In token of assent, Iona gives a tug at the reins, which sends cakes of snow flying from the horse's back and shoulders. The officer gets into the sledge. The sledge-driver clicks to the horse, cranes his neck like a swan, rises in his seat, and more from habit than necessity, brandishes his whip. The mare crags her neck too, crooks her stick-like legs, and hesitatingly sets off. Where are you shoving, you devil? Iona immediately hears shouts from the dark mass shifting to and fro before him. Where the devil are you going? Keep to the right. You don't know how to drive. Keep to the right, says the officer angrily. A coachman driving a carriage swears at him. A pedestrian crossing the road and brushing the horse's nose with his shoulder looks at him angrily and shakes the snow off his sleeve. Iona fidgets on the box as though he were sitting on thorns, jerks his elbows, and turns his eyes about, like one possessed, as though he did not know where he was, or why he was there. "'What rascals they all are!' says the officer jocosely. "'They are simply doing their best to run up against you, or fall under the horse's feet. They must be doing it on purpose.' Iona looks at his fare and moves his lips. Apparently he means to say something, but nothing comes but a sniff. <sighs> what? inquires the officer. Iona gives a wry smile, and straining his throat, brings out huskily. My son, uh, my son died this week, sir. Hmm. What did he die of? Iona turns his whole body round to his fare and says, Who can tell? 
it must have been from fever he lay three days in the hospital and then he died god's will turn round you devil comes out of the darkness have you gone cracked you old dog look where you are going drive on drive on says the officer we shan't get there till tomorrow going on like this hurry up the sledge driver cranes his neck again rises in his seat and with heavy grace swings his whip several times he looks round at the officer but the latter keeps his eyes shut and is apparently disinclined to listen putting his fare down at viborgskaya iona stops by a restaurant and again sits huddled up on the box again the wet snow paints him and his horse white one hour passes and then another three young men two tall and thin one short and hunchbacked come up railing at each other and loudly stamping on the pavement with their galoshes cabby to the police bridge the hunchback cries in a cracked voice the three of us twenty kopecks iona tugs at the reins and clicks to his horse twenty kopecks is not a fair price but he has no thoughts for that whether it is a rouble or whether it is five kopecks does not matter to him now so long as he has a fare the three young men shoving each other and using bad language go up to the sledge and all three try to sit down at once the question remains to be settled which are to sit down and which one is to stand after long altercation ill-temper and abuse they come to the conclusion that the hunchback must stand because he is the shortest well drive on says the hunchback in his cracked voice settling himself and breathing down iona's neck cut along what a cap you've got my friend you shouldn't find a worse one in all petersburg <laughs>, laughs iona it's nothing to boast of well then nothing to boast of drive on are you going to drive like this all the way eh shall i give you one in the neck my head aches says one of the tall ones at the dukmasov's yesterday vaska and i drank four bottles of brandy between us i can't make out why you talk such stuff says the other tall one angrily you lie like a brute strike me dead it's the truth it's about as true that a louse coughs <laughs> grins iona merry gentlemen Tfoo, the devil take you cries the hunchback indignantly will you get on you old plague or won't you is that the way to drive give her one with a whip hang it all give it her well iona feels behind his back the jolting person and quivering voice of the hunchback he hears abuse addressed to him and the feeling of loneliness begins little by little to be less heavy on his heart the hunchback swears at him till he chokes over some elaborately whimsical string of epithets and is overpowered by his cough his tall companions begins talking of a certain nadyezhda petrovna iona looks round at them waiting until there is a brief pause he looks round once again and says uh, this week er uh, my er uh, son died we shall all die says the hunchback with a sigh wiping his lips after coughing come drive on drive on my friends i simply cannot stand crawling like this when will he get us there well you give him a little encouragement one in the neck do you hear old plague i'll make you start if one stands on ceremony with fellows like you one may as well walk do you hear you old dragon or don't you care a hag what we say iona hears rather than feels a slap at the back of his neck he <laughs> he he laughs merry gentlemen 
God give you health. Cabman, are you married? asks one of the tall ones. I, <laughs> merry gentleman, the only wife for me now is the damp earth. Hey ho ho, the grave that is. Here's my dead son, and I am alive. It's a strange thing. Death has come in at the wrong door. Instead of coming for me, it went for my son. Ionig turns round to tell them how his son died. But at that point the hunchback gives a faint sigh and announces that, thank God, they have arrived at last. After taking his twenty kopecks, Iona gazes for a long while after the revellers, who disappear into a dark entry. Again he is alone, and again there is silence for him. The misery, which has been for a brief space erased, comes back again, and tears his heart more cruelly than ever. With a look of anxiety and suffering, Iona's eyes stray restlessly among the crowds moving to and fro on both sides of the street. Can he not find among those thousands someone who will listen to him? But the crowds flit by, heedless of him and his misery. His misery is immense, beyond all bounds. If Iona's heart were to burst and his misery to flow out, it would flood the whole world, it seems. But yet it is not seen. It has found a hiding place in such an insignificant shell that one could not have found it with a candle by daylight. Iona sees a house porter with a parcel and makes up his mind to address him. What time will it be, friend? he asks. Going on for ten. Why have you stopped here? Drive on. Iona drives a few paces away, bends himself double, and gives himself up to misery. He feels it is no good to appeal to people. But before five minutes have passed, he draws himself up, shakes his head as though he feels a sharp pain, and tugs at the reins. He can bear it no longer. Back to the yard, he thinks. To the yard! And this little mare, as though she knew his thoughts, falls to trotting. An hour and a half later, Iona is sitting by a big dirty stove. On the stove, on the floor, and on the benches are people snoring. The air is full of smells and stuffiness. Iona looks at the sleeping figures, scratches himself, and regrets that he has come home so early. I have not earned enough to pay for the oats, even, he thinks. That's why I am so miserable. A man who knows how to do his work, who has had enough to eat, and whose horse has had enough to eat, is always at ease. In one of the corners a young cabman gets up, clears his throat sleepily, and makes for the water bucket. Want a drink? Iona asks him. Seems so. May it do you good. But my son is dead, mate. Do you hear? A week in the hospital. It's a queer business. Iona looks to see the effect produced by his words, but he sees nothing. The young man has covered his head over and is already asleep. The old man sighs and scratches himself. Just as the young man had been thirsty for water, he thirsts for speech. His son will soon have been dead a week and he has not really talked to anybody yet. He wants to talk of it properly, with deliberation. He wants to tell how his son was taken ill, how he suffered, what he said before he died, how he died. He wants to describe the funeral and how he went to the hospital to get his son's clothes. He still has his daughter Anisia in the country, and he wants to talk about her, too. Yes, he has plenty to talk about now. His listener ought to sigh and exclaim and lament. It would be even better to talk to women, though they are silly creatures. They blubber at the first word. Let's go out and have 
a look at the mare. Iona thinks, there is always time for sleep. You'll have sleep enough, no fear. He puts on his coat and goes into the stables where his mare is standing. He thinks about oats, about hay, about the weather. He cannot think about his son when he is alone. To talk about him with someone is possible. But to think of him and picture him is insufferable anguish. Are you munching? Iona asks his mare, seeing her shining eyes. There, munch away, munch away. Since we have not earned enough for oats, we will eat hay. Yes, I have grown too old to drive. My son ought to be driving, not I. He was a real cabman. He ought to have lived. Iona is silent for a while. And then he goes on. That's how it is, old girl. Kuzma Ionich is gone. He said goodbye to me. He went and died. For no reason. Now s suppose you had a little colt, and you were own mother to that little colt. And all at once that same little colt went and died. You'd be sorry, wouldn't you? The little mare munches, listens, and breathes on her master's hands. Iona is carried away and tells her all about it. End of Misery by Anton Chekhov This recording is in the public domain. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake of a novel according to hints from various quarters by jane austen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by julie van wallichem plan of a novel according to hints from various quarters by jane austen seen to be in the country heroine the daughter of a clergyman one who after having lived much in the world had retired from it and settled in a curacy with a very small fortune of his own he the most excellent man that can be imagined perfect in character temper and manners without the smallest drawback or peculiarity to prevent his being the most delightful companion to his daughter from one year's end to the other heroine a faultless character herself perfectly good with much tenderness and sentiment and not the least wit very highly accomplished understanding modern languages and generally speaking everything that the most accomplished young women learn but particularly excelling in music, her favourite pursuit, and playing equally well on the pianoforte and harp, and singing in the first style. Her person quite beautiful, dark eyes and plump cheeks. Book to open with a description of father and daughter, who are to converse in long speeches, elegant language, and a tone of high, serious sentiment. The father to be induced at his daughter's earnest request, to relate to her the past events of his life. This narrative will reach through the greatest part of the first volume, as, besides all the circumstances of his attachment to her mother and their marriage, it will comprehend his going to sea as a chaplain to his distinguished naval character about the court, his going afterwards to court himself, which introduced him to a great variety of characters and involved him in many interesting situations, concluding with his opinion of the benefits to result from tithes being done away, and his having buried his own mother, Heron's lamented grandmother, in consequence of the high priest of the parish in which he died, refusing to pay her remains the respect due to them. The father, to be of a very literary turn, an enthusiast in literature, nobody's enemy but his own. 
at the same time most zealous in the discharge of his pastoral duties, the model of an exemplary parish priest. The heroine's friendship to be sought after by a young woman in the same neighbourhood, of talents and shrewdness, with light eyes and a fair skin, but having a considerable degree of wit, heroine shall shrink from the acquaintance. From this outset the story will proceed, and contain a striking variety of adventures. Heroine and her father, never above a fortnight together in one place, he being driven from his curacy by the vile arts of some totally unprincipled and heartless young man, desperately in love with the heroine, and pursuing her with unrelenting passion. No sooner settled in one country of Europe, than they are necessitated to quit it and retire to another, always making new acquaintance, and always obliged to leave them. This will, of course, exhibit a wide variety of characters, but there will be no mixture. The scene will be forever shifting from one set of people to another. But all the good will be unexceptionable in every respect, and there will be no foibles or weaknesses, but with the wicked, who will be completely depraved and infamous, hardly a resemblance of humanity left in them. Early in her career, in the progress of her first removals, Heron must meet with the hero, all perfection of course, and only prevented from paying his addresses to her by some excess of refinement. Wherever she goes, somebody falls in love with her, and she receives repeated offers of marriage, which she always refers wholly to her father, exceedingly angry that he should not be first applied to often carried away by the anti-hero, but rescued either by her father or the hero, often reduced to support herself and her father by her talents and work for her bread, continually cheated and defrauded of her hire, worn down to a skeleton and now and then starved to death. At last, hunted out of civilized society, denied a poor shelter of the humblest cottage, they are compelled to retreat into Kamchatka, where the poor father, quite worn down, finding his end approaching, throws himself on the ground, and after four or five hours of tender advice and paternal admonition to his miserable child, expires in a fine burst of literary enthusiasm, intermingled with invectives against hordes of tithes. Heroin inconsolable for some time but afterwards crawls back towards her former country, having at least twenty narrow escapes of falling into the hands of anti-hero, and at last, in the very nick of time, turning a corner to avoid him, runs into the arms of the hero himself, who, having just shaken off the scruples which fettered him before, was at the very moment setting off in pursuit of her. The tenderest and completest éclaircissement takes place, and they are happily united. Throughout the whole work, Heron to be in the most elegant society and living in high style. The name of the work not to be Emma, but of the same sort as Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice. And of Plan of a Novel, According to Hints from Various Quarters, by Jane Austen. Tale of Squirrel Nutkin by Beatrix Potter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn Francis. The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin by Beatrix Potter. This is a tale about a tail, a tail that belonged to a little red squirrel, and his name was Nutkin. He had a brother called Twinkleberry, and a great many cousins. They lived in a wood at the edge of a lake. In the middle of the lake there is an island covered with trees and nut bushes, 
and amongst those trees stands a hollow oak tree, which is the house of an owl who is called Old Brown. One autumn, when the nuts were ripe, and the leaves on the hazel bushes were golden and green, Nutkin and Twinkleberry and all the other little squirrels came out of the wood and down to the edge of the lake. They made little rafts out of twigs, and they paddled away over the water to Owl Island to gather nuts. Each squirrel had a little sack and a large oar and spread out his tail for a sail. They also took with them an offering of three fat mice as a present for Old Brown, and they put them down upon his doorstep. Then Twinkleberry and the other little squirrels each made a low bow and said politely, Old Mr. Brown, will you favor us with permission to gather nuts upon your island? But Nutkin was excessively impertinent in his manners. He bobbed up and down like a little red cherry, singing, Riddle me, riddle me, rot tot tot, a little wee man in a red, red coat, a staff in his hand and a stone in his throat. If you'll tell me this riddle, I'll give you a groat. Now this riddle is as old as the hills. Mr. Brown paid no attention whatever to Nutkin. He shut his eyes obstinately and went to sleep. The squirrels filled their little sacks with nuts and sailed away home in the evening. But next morning they all came back again to Owl Island, and Twinkleberry and the others brought a fine fat mole and laid it on the stone in front of Old Brown's doorway and said, Mr. Brown, will you favor us with your gracious permission to gather some more nuts? But Nutkin who had no respect, began to dance up and down, tickling old Mr. Brown with a nettle, and singing, Old Mr. B, riddle me re, hitty pity within the wall, hitty pity without the wall. If you touch hitty pity, hitty pity will bite you. Mr. Brown woke up suddenly and carried the mole into his house. He shut the door in Nutkin's face. Presently, a little thread of blue smoke from a wood fire came up from the top of the tree, and Nutkin peeped through the keyhole and sang, A house full, a hole full, you cannot gather a bowl full. The squirrels searched for nuts all over the island and filled their little sacks. But Nutkin gathered oak apples, yellow and scarlet, and sat upon a beech stump playing marbles and watching the door of old Mr. Brown. On the third day, the squirrels got up very early and went fishing. They caught seven fat minnows as a present for old Brown. They paddled over the lake and landed under a crooked chestnut tree on Owl Island. Twinkleberry and six other little squirrels each carried a fat minnow, but Nutkin, who had no nice manners, brought no present at all. He ran in front, singing, The man in the wilderness said to me, How many strawberries grow in the sea? I answered him, as I thought good, as many red herrings as grow in the wood. But old Mr. Brown took no interest in riddles, not even when the answer was provided for him. On the fourth day, the squirrels brought a present of six fat beetles, which were as good as plums in plum pudding for Old Brown. Each beetle was wrapped up carefully in a dock leaf, fastened with a pine needle pin. But Nutkin sang as rudely as ever, Old Mr. B, riddle me re, flower of England, fruit of Spain, meet together in a shower of rain. Put in a bag tied round with a string. If you'll tell me this riddle, I'll give you a ring. Which was ridiculous of Nutkin, because he had not got any ring to give to Old Brown. The other squirrels hunted up and down the nut bushes, but Nutkin gathered Robin's pincushions off of a briar bush and stuck them full of pine needle pins. 
On the fifth day, the squirrels brought a present of wild honey. It was so sweet and sticky that they licked their fingers as they put it down upon the stone. They had stolen it out of a bumblebee's nest on the tippity top of the hill. But Nutkin skipped up and down, singing, Hum a bum, buzz, buzz, hum a bum, buzz. As I went over tipple time, I met a flock of bonny swine, some yellow necked, some yellow backed. They were the very bonniest swine that e'er went over tipple time. Old Mr. Brown turned up his eyes in disgust at the impertinence of Nutkin, but he ate up the honey. The squirrels filled their little sacks with nuts, but Nutkin sat upon a big flat rock and played ninepins with a crab apple and green fir cones. On the sixth day, which was Saturday, the squirrels came again for the last time. They brought a new laid egg in a little rush basket as a last parting present for Old Brown. But Nutkin ran in front laughing and shouting, Humpty Dumpty lies in the beck with a white counterpane round his neck. Forty doctors and forty rights cannot put Humpty Dumpty to rights. Now, old Mr. Brown took an interest in eggs. He opened one eye and shut it again, but still he did not speak. Nutkin became more and more impertinent. Old Mr. B! Old Mr. B! Hickamore, Hackamore, on the king's kitchen door! All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't drive Hickamore, Hackamore, off the king's kitchen door! Nutkin danced up and down like a sunbeam, but still Old Brown said nothing at all. Nutkin began again. Arthur O'Bower has broken his band. He comes roaring up the land. The King of Scots, with all his power, cannot turn Arthur of the Bower. Nutkin made a whirring noise to sound like the wind, and he took a running jump right onto the head of Old Brown. Then, all at once, there was a flutterment and a scufflement and a loud squeak. The other squirrels scuttered away into the bushes. When they came back very cautiously, peeping round the tree, there was Old Brown sitting on his doorstep, quite still, with his eyes closed, as if nothing had happened. But Nutkin was in his waistcoat pocket. This looks like the end of the story, but it isn't. Old Brown carried Nutkin into his house and held him up by the tail, intending to skin him. But Nutkin pulled so very hard that his tail broke in two, and he dashed up the staircase and escaped out of the attic window. And to this day, if you meet Nutkin up a tree and ask him a riddle, he will throw sticks at you and stamp his feet and scold and shout, Cuck, 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 cruck, cuck, cuck. End of The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin Recording by Carolyn Francis We Willy Winky by Rudyard Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. We Willy Winky by Rudyard Kipling. His full name was Percival William Williams, but he picked up the other name in a nursery book, and that was the end of christened titles. His mother's Aya called him Willy Baba. But, as he never paid the faintest attention to anything that the Ayah said, her wisdom did not help matters. His father was the colonel of the 195th, and as soon as wee Willy Winky was old enough to understand what military discipline meant, Colonel Williams put him under it. There was no other way of managing the child. When he was good for a week, he drew good conduct pay, 
and when he was bad, he was deprived of his good conduct stripe. Generally he was bad, for India offers so many chances to little six-year-olds of going wrong. Children resent familiarity from strangers, and wee Willy Winky was a very particular child. Once he accepted an acquaintance, he was graciously pleased to thaw. He accepted Brandis, a subaltern of the 195th, on site. Brandis was having tea at the Colonel's, and wee Willy Winky entered strong in the possession of a good conduct badge, one for not chasing hens round the compound. He regarded Brandis with gravity for at least ten minutes, and then delivered himself of his opinion. "'I like you,' he said slowly, getting off his chair and coming over to Brandis. "'I like you. I shall call you Copy, because of your hair. Do you mind being called Copy? It is because of the hair, you know.' Here was one of the most embarrassing of wee Willy Winky's peculiarities. He would look at a stranger for some time, and then, without warning or explanation, would give him a name. And the name stuck. No regimental penalties could break Wee Willy Winky of this habit. He lost his good conduct badge for christening the commissioner's wife, Pobbs, but nothing that the colonel could do could make the station forego the nickname, and Miss Colin remained Mrs. Pobbs until the end of her stay. So Brandis was christened Copy, and rose, therefore, in the estimation of the regiment. If Wee Willy Winky took an interest in anyone, the fortunate man was envied alike by the mess and the rank and file, and in their envy lay no suspicion of self-interest. The colonel's son was idolized on his own merits entirely. Yet wee Willy Winky was not lovely, his face permanently freckled, as his legs were permanently scratched, and, in spite of his mother's almost tearful remonstrances, he had insisted upon having his long yellow locks cut short in the military fashion. "'I want my hair like Sergeant Tummel,' said wee Willy Winky, and his father abetting, the sacrifice was accomplished." Three weeks after the bestowal of his youthful affections on Lieutenant Brandis, henceforth to be called Copy, for the sake of brevity, wee Willy Winky was destined to behold strange things and far beyond his comprehension. Copy returned his liking with interest. Copy had let him wear for five rapturous minutes his own big sword, just as tall as wee Willy Winky. Copy had promised him a terrier puppy, and Copy had permitted him to witness the miraculous operation of shaving. Nay, more. Copy had said that even he, wee Willy Winky, would rise in time to the ownership of a box of shiny knives, a silver soap-box, and a silver-handled sputter-brush, as Wee Willy Winky called it. Decidedly, there was no one except his father, who could give or take away good conduct badges at pleasure, half so wise, strong, and valiant as Copy, with the Afghan and Egyptian medals on his breast. Why, then, should Copy be guilty of the unmanly weakness of kissing, vehemently kissing, a big girl, Miss Allardyce to wit? In the course of a morning ride, Wee Willy Winky had seen Copy so doing, and, like the gentleman he was, had promptly wheeled round and cantered back to his groom, lest the groom should also see. Under ordinary circumstances he would have spoken to his father, but he felt instinctively that this was a matter on which Copy ought first to be consulted. Copy, shouted Wee Willy Winky, reining up outside that subaltern's bungalow early one morning. I want to see you, Copy. Come in, young'un, returned Copy, who was at early breakfast in the midst of his dogs. What mischief have you been getting into now? Wee Willy Winky had done nothing notoriously bad for three days, and so stood on a pinnacle of virtue. "'I've been doing nothing bad,' said he, curling up into a long chair with a studious affectation of the colonel's languor after a hot parade. He buried his freckled nose in a teacup, and, with eyes staring roundly over the rim, asked, "'I say, Copy, is it proper to kiss big girls?' "'By Jove, you're beginning early. Who do you want to kiss?' "'No one. My mother is always kissing me if I don't stop her.' If it isn't proper, how was you kissing Miss Allardyce's big girl last morning, by the canal? Copy's brow wrinkled. He and Miss Allardyce had with great craft managed to keep their engagement secret for a fortnight. There were urgent and imperative reasons why Major Allardyce should not know how matters stood for at least another month, and this small marplot had discovered a great deal too much. I saw you, said Wee Willy Winky calmly, but the groom didn't see. I said, Hut Jow. Oh, you had that much sense, you young rip groaned poor Copy, half amused and half angry. And how many people may you have told about it? Only me myself. You didn't tell when I twied to buy the buffalo when my pony was lame, and I thought you wouldn't like. Winky, said Copy enthusiastically, shaking the small hand. You're the best of good fellows. Look here, you can't understand all these things. One of these days, hang it, how can I make you see it? I'm going to marry Miss Allardyce, and then she'll be Mrs. Copy, as you say. If your young mind is so scandalized at the idea of kissing big girls, go and tell your father. What will happen? asked Wee Willy Winky, who firmly believed that his father was omnipotent. I shall get into trouble, said Copy, 
playing his trump card with an appealing look at the holder of the ace. "'Then I won't,' said Wee Willie Winkie briefly. "'But my father says it's unmanly to be always kissing, and I didn't think you'd do that, Copy. "'I'm not always kissing, old chap. It's only now and then, and when you're bigger you'll do it too. Your father meant that it's not good for little boys.' "'Ah!' said Wee Willie Winkie, now fully enlightened. "'It's like the sputter brush. "'Exactly,' said Copy gravely. "'But I don't think I ever want to kiss big girls. "'Nor no one set my mother, and I must that, you know.' "'There was a long pause, broken by Wee Willie Winkie. "'Are you fond of this big girl, Copy?' "'Awfully,' said Copy. "'Fonder than you are of Belle, or Vibucha, or me?' "'It's in a different way,' said Copy. "'You see, one of these days Miss Allardyce will belong to me, "'but you'll grow up and command the regiment, and all sorts of things. "'It's quite different, you see.' "'Very well,' said Wee Willie Winkie, rising. "'If you're fond of the big girl, I won't tell anyone. "'I must go now.' Copy rose and escorted his small guest to the door, adding, "'You're the best of little fellows, Winkie. I tell you what. "'In thirty days from now you can tell if you like. Tell any one you like.' Thus the secret of the Brandis Allardyce engagement was dependent on a little child's word. Copy, who knew Wee Willie Winkie's idea of truth, was at ease, for he felt that he would not break promises. Wee Willie Winkie betrayed a special and unusual interest in Miss Allardyce, and, slowly revolving round that embarrassed young lady, was used to regarding her gravely with unwinking eye. He was trying to discover why Copy should have kissed her. She was not half so nice as his own mother. On the other hand, she was Copy's property, and would in time belong to him. Therefore, it behooved him to treat her with as much respect as Copy's big sword or shiny pistol. The idea that he shared a great secret in common with Copy kept Wee Willie Winky unusually virtuous for three weeks. Then the old Adam broke out, and he made what he called a campfire at the bottom of the garden. How could he have foreseen that the flying sparks would have lighted the colonel's little haystack and consumed a week's store for the horses? Sudden and swift was the punishment, depriving of the good conduct badge, and, most sorrowful of all, two days' confinement to barracks, the house in the veranda, coupled with the withdrawal of the light of his father's countenance. He took the sentence like the man he strove to be, drew himself up with a quivering under lip, saluted, and once clear of the room, ran to weep bitterly in his nursery, called by him my quarters. Copy came in the afternoon and attempted to console the culprit. "'I'm under a west,' said Wee Willie Winkie mournfully, "'and I didn't ought to speak to you.' Very early the next morning he climbed to the roof of the house, that was not forbidden, and beheld Miss Allardyce going for a ride. "'Where are you going?' cried Wee Willie Winkie. "'Across the river,' she answered, and trotted forward. Now the cantonment in which the 195th lay was bounded on the north by a river, dry in the winter. From his earliest years, Wee Willie Winkie had been forbidden to go across the river, and had noted that even Copy, the almost almighty Copy, had never set foot beyond it. Wee Willie Winkie had once been read to, out of a big blue book, The History of the Princess and the Goblins, a most wonderful tale of a land where the goblins were always warring with the children of men until they were defeated by one curity. Ever since that date it seemed to him that the bare black and purple hills across the river were inhabited by goblins, and, in truth, Every one had said that there lived the bad men. Even in his own house the lower halves of the windows were covered with green paper on account of the bad men who might, if allowed clear view, fire into peaceful drawing-rooms and comfortable bedrooms. Certainly, beyond the river, which was the end of all the earth, lived the bad men. And here was Major Allardyce's big girl, Copy's property, preparing to venture into their borders. What would Copy say if anything happened to her, if the goblins ran off with her as they did the curdy princess? She must at all hazards be turned back. The house was still. Wee Willie Winkie reflected for a moment on the very terrible wrath of his father, and then broke his arrest. It was a crime unspeakable. The low sun threw his shadow, very large and very black, on the trim garden paths, as he went down to the stables and ordered his pony. It seemed to him in the hush of the dawn that all the big world had been bidden to stand still and look at Wee Willie Winkie, guilty of mutiny. The drowsy groom handed him his mount, and since the one great sin made all others insignificant, Wee Willie Winkie said that he was going to ride over to Kapi Sahib, and went out at a foot-pace, stepping on the soft mold of the flower borders. The devastating track of the pony's feet was the last misdeed that cut him off from all the sympathy of humanity. He turned into the road, leaned forward, and rode as fast as the pony could put foot to the ground in the direction of the river. But the liveliest of twelve two ponies can do little against the long canter of a waller. Miss Allardyce was far ahead, had passed through the corps, beyond the police post, when all the guards were asleep, 
and her mount was scattering the pebbles of the river bed, as wee Willie Winkie left the cantonment and in British India behind him. Bowed forward and still flogging, wee Willie Winkie shot into Afghan territory, and could just see Miss Allardyce a black speck flickering across the stony plain. The reason of her wandering was simple enough. Copy, in a tone of too hastily assured authority, had told her overnight that she must not ride out by the river, and she had gone to prove her own spirit and teach Copy a lesson. Almost at the foot of the inhospitable hills, wee Willie Winkie saw the waller blunder and come down heavily. Miss Allardyce struggled clear, but her ankle had been severely twisted, and she could not stand. Having thus demonstrated her spirit, she wept copiously, and was surprised by the apparition of a white, wide-eyed child in khaki, on a nearly spent pony. "'Are you badly, badly hurted?' shouted wee Willie Winkie as soon as he was within range. "'You didn't ought to be here.' "'I don't know,' said Miss Allardyce, ruefully, ignoring the reproof. "'Good gracious, child, what are you doing here?' "'You said you was going across Wee Wiver, panted Wee Willie Winkie, throwing himself off his pony. "'And nobody, not even Copy, must go across Wee Wiver, and I came after you so hard, but you wouldn't stop. "'And now you've hurted yourself, and Copy will be angry with me, and I've woken my west. "'I've woken my west. The future colonel of the 195th sat down and sobbed. In spite of the pain in her ankle, the girl was moved. "'Have you ridden all the way from the cantonments, little man? What for?' "'You belong to Copy. Copy told me so,' wailed Wee Willie Winkie disconsolately. "'I saw him kissing you, and he said he was fonder of you than Bell or Vibucha or me. And so I came. "'You must get up and come back. You didn't ought to be here. This is a bad place, and I've woken my west.' "'I can't move, Winkie,' said Miss Allardyce with a groan. "'I've hurt my foot. What shall I do?' She showed a readiness to weep afresh, which steadied Wee Willie Winkie, who had been brought up to believe that tears were the depth of unmanliness. Still, when one is as great a sinner as wee Willie Winkie, even a man may be permitted to break down. Winkie, said Miss Allardyce, when you've rested a little, ride back and tell them to send someone out to carry me back in. It hurts fearfully. The child sat still for a little time, and Miss Allardyce closed her eyes. The pain was nearly making her faint. She was roused by wee Willie Winkie tying up the reins to his pony's neck and setting it free with a vicious cut of his whip that made it wicker. The little animal headed towards the cantonments. "'Oh, Winkie, what are you doing?' "'Hush,' said Wee Willie Winkie. "'There's a man coming, one of the bad men. "'I must stay with you. "'My father says a man must always look after a girl. "'Jack will go home, and then they'll come look for us. "'That's why I let him go.' "'Not one man, but two or three had appeared "'from behind the rocks of the hills, "'and the heart of Wee Willie Winkie sank within him, "'for in just this manner were the goblins "'want to steal out and vex Curdie's soul. "'Thus they had played in Curdie's garden.' He had seen the picture, and thus they had frightened the princess's nurse. He heard them talking to each other, and recognized with joy the bastard Pushto that he had picked up from one of his father's grooms, lately dismissed. People who spoke that tongue could not be the bad men. They were only natives, after all. They came up to the boulders on which Miss Allardyce's horse had blundered. Then rose from the rock wee Willie Winkie, child of the dominant race, aged six and three quarters, and said briefly and emphatically, Yow! The pony across the river bed. The men laughed, and laughter from natives was the one thing wee Willie Winkie could not tolerate. He asked them what they wanted, and why they did not depart. Other men, with most evil faces and crooked stock guns, crept out of the shadows of the hills, till soon wee Willie Winkie was face to face with an audience some twenty strong. Miss Allardyce screamed. "'Who are you?' said one of the men. "'I am the Colonel Sahib's son, and my order is that you go at once. You black men are frightening Miss Sahib.' One of you must run to the cantonments and make the news that Miss Saib has hurt herself and that the colonel's son is here with her. Put our feet into the trap, was the laughing reply. Hear this boy's speech. Say that I sent you, I, the colonel's son. They will give you money. What is the use of this talk? Take up the child and the girl, and we can at least ask for the ransom. Ours are the villages on the heights, said a voice in the background. These were the bad men, worse than goblins and it needed all wee Willie Winkie's training to prevent him from bursting into tears. But he felt that the cry before a native, excepting only his mother's ayah, would be an infamy greater than any mutiny. Moreover, he, as future colonel of the 195th, had that grim regiment at his back. "'Are you going to carry us away?' said wee Willie Winkie, very blanched and uncomfortable. "'Yes, my little Sahib Bahadur,' said the tallest of the men, "'and eat you afterwards.' "'That is child's talk,' said wee Willie Winkie. "'Men do not eat men.' A yell of laughter interrupted him, but he went on firmly. And if you do carry us away, 
I tell you that all my regiment will come up in a day and kill you all without leaving one. Who will take my message to the Colonel Sahib? Speech in any vernacular, and wee Willy Winky had a colloquial acquaintance with three, was easy to the boy who could not yet manage his R's and thus aright. Another man joined the conference, crying, O oh, foolish men, what this babe says is true. His is the heart's heart of those white troops. For the sake of peace let them go both, for if he is taken, the regiment will break loose and gut the valley. Our villages are in the valley, and we shall not escape. That regiment are devils. They broke Koko Yar's breastbone with kicks when he tried to take the rifles. And if we touch this child they will fire and rape and plunder for a month, till nothing remain. Better to send a man back to take the message and get a reward. I say that this child is their god, and that they will spare none of us, nor our women, if we harm him. It was Din Mohammed, the dismissed groom of the colonel who made the diversion, and an angry and heated discussion followed. We Willie Winky standing over Miss Allardyce waited the upshot. Surely his wedgement, his own wedgement, would not desert him if they knew of his extremity. The riderless pony brought the news to the 195th, though there had been consternation in the colonel's household for an hour before. The little beast came into the parade ground in front of the main barracks, where the men were setting down to play spoil five till the afternoon. Devlin, the color sergeant of E Company, glanced at the empty saddle and tumbled through the barracks room, kicking up each room corporal as he passed. Up, oh, ye beggars! There's something happened to the colonel's son, he shouted. He couldn't fall off, so help me. He couldn't fall off, blubbered a drummer boy. Go and hunt him across the river. He's over there if he's anywhere, and maybe those pathans have got him. For the love of God, don't look for him in the nullahs. Let's go to the river. There's sense in Mott yet, said Devlin. E Company, double out to the river. Shop. So E Company, in its shirt sleeves mainly, doubled for dear life, and in the rear toiled the perspiring sergeant, adjuring it to double yet faster. The cantonment was alive with the men of the 195th hunting for Wee Willie Winky, and the colonel finally overtook E Company, far too exhausted to swear, struggling in the pebbles of the river bed. Up the hill under which Wee Willie Winky's bad men were discussing the wisdom of carrying off the child and the girl, a lookout fired two shots. "'What have I said?' shouted Din Mohammed. "'There is a warning. The Poulton are out already, and are coming across the plain. Get away. Let us not be seen with the boy.' The men waited for an instant, and then, as another shot was fired, withdrew into the hills, silently as they had appeared. "'The wedgeman is coming,' said Wee Willie Winky confidently to Miss Allardyce. "'It's all white. Don't cry. He needed the advice himself, for ten minutes later, when his father came up, he was weeping bitterly with his head in Miss Allardyce's lap. And the men of the 195th carried him home with shouts and rejoicings, and Coppy, who had ridden a horse into a lather, met him, and to his intense disgust, kissed him openly in the presence of the men. But there was a balm for his dignity. His father assured him that not only would the breaking of arrest be condoned, but that the good conduct badge would be restored as soon as his mother could sew it on his blouse sleeve. Miss Allardyce had told the colonel the story that made him proud of his son. "'She belonged to you, Coppy,' said Wee Willie Winky, indicating Miss Allardyce with a grimy forefinger. "'I knew she didn't ought to go across Wee Wiver, and I knew Wee Wedgiment would come to me if I sent Jack home.' "'You're a hero, Winky,' said Coppy. "'A puka hero!' "'I don't know what that means,' said Wee Willie Winky. "'But you mustn't call me Winky any no more. I'm Percival Willem Willems.' And in this manner did Wee Willie Winky enter into his manhood. End of Wee Willy Winky